Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Echoed. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm just going to do a quick introduction so that we can start the program um, and introduce myself. I'm Lindsay Buckman. I run Seaton Street Press, and we're here with William Camargo and Genesis Baez. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you had the description for the program. So I'm going to read from our description, which is that this conversation brings together photographers William Camargo and Genesis Baez, moderated by Seaton Street Press, to discuss Camargo's recent publication, We've Been Here. The publication depicts Anaheim, California as a contested site examining gentrification, colonized land, and Mexican, Chicanx, and Latinx histories. We've been here and acts counter stories to challenge the erasure and mixed characterization of Latinx communities, revealing varied histories of oppression and disempowerment in the region contrasted by community activism. Together, Baez and Camargo will discuss their lens-based practices and the importance of photographic narratives to empower and rewrite dominant canons of photography, while exploring the relationship between place, land, and community within visual representation. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to give everyone just a little bit of context about William's publication, so I'm just going to read the abbreviated version. We Been Here considers how Orange County's Anaheim is often portrayed through homogenous mythologies demarcated by the entertainment resort Disneyland and yet home to a brown working class. By centering the lived experiences of people of color, Camargo works to insert the importance of photographic narratives, empowering and rewriting dominant canons of lens-based practices, picturing Anaheim for who it represents. Um, so today's conversation is really centered around William's recent publication. And I also wanted to give you bios for both artists before we move into the conversation. So William Camargo is a photo-based artist and educator born and raised in Anaheim, California. He is currently the chair of the Heritage and Cultural Commission in Anaheim and a lecturer of photography at the University of California, San Diego and Cal State Fullerton. He attained his MFA from Claremont Graduate University, a BFA from Cal State Fullerton and an AA of Fullerton Community College. William is the founder and curator of the Latinx Diaspora Archives, an archive Instagram page that elevates communities of color through family photographs. He uses photography, installation, public intervention, and archives to address issues of gentrification, police violence, and Chicanx and Latinx history. William has held residencies at the Latinx Project at NYU, Lightwork in Syracuse, New York, Tilt Institute for Contemporary Image in Philadelphia, and the Center for Photography at Woodstock, New York. Genesis Baez is an artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Born in Massachusetts, Baez was raised in both the Northeast of US and Puerto Rico. She holds an MFA in photography from Yale University, where she was awarded the John Ferguson Ware Award for Excellence and a BFA with honors from MassArt. She is also an alumni of the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Baez has exhibited her work internationally, including Arco Madrid, Huxley Parlor in London, Yancey Richardson in New York, and Chart in New York. Baez is a 2020 NYFA and NYSCA Fellow in Photography and is the recipient of the 2020 Capricious Photo Award for the forthcoming publication of a monograph. Her work was recently has recently appeared in publications such as Aperture and Bomb Magazine. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to begin the conversation with place, which is such a central component of this publication. So if we could, um, could you talk, both of you, could you talk about the role of place within your work and its importance within your lens-based practices? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks, thank you everyone for being here. It's, uh, I think, my first time physically uh, doing uh, a talk here in New York. Um, but the reason also I wanted to be here with Genesis Bias is because I think uh, our work, even though it's aesthetically a little different, really thinks about this this way of place, right? This uh, for myself, my practice is really about negotiating these kind of like frictious land spaces um, when finding the history of of my city and realizing that I was kind of going about my day and not realizing that there was this kind of like land history that sometimes would have kept me off, right? Or have these really kind of moments 
in my head and thinking I wouldn't be, I wouldn't belong here, I don't belong here. Um, and I think, you know, I spent uh, a month with Genesis at Woodstock and, and we talked about place and, and how it, it is a commonality with that. And also I just wanted to, you know, hear how your practice and how this place kind of comes about your work. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, of course. Thank you, William. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, so when I would say that the idea of place is kind of foundational in my work, but I'm more so thinking about the mark of a place on a person or on me um, and place as fluid, place as um, dispersed. Um, I think my work and my investigations are more so rooted in um, more of a diasporic experience and what happens when you leave a place or when your um, you know, family leaves a place, what happens after words, right? And the mark of a place on a person. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think we're, when we're looking at these two diasporas too, they have so much history here and, and, mm -hmm. and the movement of people is, is so important too, I think, in, in that work. Yeah. Um, and I think you create it in a, in a very beautiful way with your practice. Yeah, yeah, and just to be clear too, like when I say diasporic kind of experiences, I'm specifically referring to a Puerto Rican diasporic experience, which is really specific, especially in this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have images too um, that you can look to yeah. up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, actually, can um, can you just go back really quickly to the green picture too? Um, and just another thing in terms of place, I'm thinking a lot about how place can actually be conjured and um, a place um, can exist inside of you even when you can not exist inside of it. Um, so a lot of my works kind of speak to like conjuring place where place didn't previously exist. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, I, I really enjoy um, that work and, and you know, this thought about place for me has kind of been um, discovering or memory of an archive that I find and I respond to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, um, because of that absence of, of memories and um, lived experience in that diaspora community that was there in my city for mm -hmm. over a hundred years. Um, and I think I try to place myself within that history and stake a claim to that history as well, right? So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I also just like to always poke fun of, <laughs> not poke fun at, but like use a lot of the canonical figures uh, that I learned in, in school, right. Um, right? Like this one, it's, you know, after Stephen Shore. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and it also feels like your work um, or your process is also about like going like deeper into the place, like a very specific geographic place, whereas my work is almost made in the dispersion, <laughs> right? Like in in the distance from a place. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it, mm -hmm. and it, I think it works beautifully in both mm -hmm. ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I know many artists here in the audience. Like this is probably the reason. Also, I love all your work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think specifically like for people here from the that like Puerto Rican diaspora and, and Mexican American and, and Latinx diasporas too. There's, uh, there's so many ways to conjure these kind of feelings, um, notions and, and histories within all that work. Um, and I love seeing it, you know, in the work of Janice Baez and, and uh, other folks um, hmm. that we're always in conversation with. Um, mm -hmm. And not until we were, you know, stuck in the in the in the old uh, house in Woodstock it's you know where these conversations started happening uh, and we started seeing a lot of correlation between our work too mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah so you both have a shared investment in photography's ability to present counter narratives um, predominantly to challenge colonial history and in William's publication, counter histories are presented through his photographs situated with the archival images, writing, and poetry from your community. So I was wondering if you could both speak about how you utilize photography to empower this multiplicity of narrative. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think for me, it was just kind of digging this archive that I thought was never there uh, in, the, in the beginning, right? I never learned about some of this history um, that I discovered, I mean, as a mid-25-year-old or mm -hmm. mid 
early 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like I mentioned, like staking the claim to these counter stories and counter archives that I did find was kind of an issue of, of pride too as well, that we had built the city, that we had a lot of kind of investment in the city. Um, and these archives really kind of, you know, when I show my work, I don't like to show the archives like most of the time, right? I just like to live, have the work lived. Um, you know, the validation of knowledge is something that we're always kind of battling when it comes to academia and like who validates the knowledge, who will silence it, who tries to erase it. Um, and that was really important to me to kind of, uh, but also to just see the, you know, the the work and the archive and these very joyous folks that we don't see, right? We see these counter uh, images in the media uh, and I'm always trying to go against that, that grain, right? Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why I kind of left like documentary photography and like photojournalism because of that reason of just kind of trauma porn um, and not really kind of digging into some of the issues that we were talking about. And, you know, this tool, the camera has a, a, a quite a bit of history, right? Um, and, and not a, a very nice history. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think as a liberatory tool, it's, it's been essential for a lot of, a lot of, you know, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, um, you know, having autonomy with, with the camera has been something that's been, been amazing to have. And I think, again, like, like I mentioned, the work of you, Genesis has been kind of also, um, freeing too, right? I see that kind of, um, some moment of, of freedom as well in, in that work and your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk about this process because I hear you um, almost like mentioning a slowness, like mm -hmm. an like a like an investment in kind of going back and working with this place over and over again and with people rather than kind of parachuting in and then leaving. Yeah, I think for me, I'm really excited about imagination and how photog like with photography i can use the visible world to describe something that i can't necessarily see or like how can i make pictures of invisible things <laughs> or or kind of conjuring something that only exists for the camera or that like needs the camera in order to exist like when we were standing there it didn't necessarily look like that. Um, but all of that kind of speaking to a kind of subjectivity, I'm really excited about how unfixed and slippery photographs are. And I think for me, that's like a way of diverging a bit from, I don't know, these traditions of objectivity. <laughs> yeah. Know, and that, I, yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I mean, we're, I'm looking at this word cause I, you know, I saw the process, um, during our time together, yeah, you were there when I made that, <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a, a you know a, an image that took quite a while to make, but also yeah. like um, you know the can you talk about like a little bit of the you know the um, you know the water that is in your work and and the mm. the cloud figures. I think that was extremely what I see uh, in quite uh, a lot of your work that kind of connects these these two things. Yeah, the water. Oh my God, the water. <laughs> <laughs> the water. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about water um, and how it's not just a metaphor, like not all is well with the waters of the world. Um, but I think that's something that I'm trying to kind of unpack for myself. I think for a very long time, it, I have been thinking about it somewhat as a metaphor and somewhat um, as like a poetic tool, right? Something that is unfixed, that is always moving. It's the thing between the places. It's the space between the Caribbean and the U.S. mainland. And um, thinking about me and my own identity and fluidity as water um but something that i am kind of considering i think especially in light of recent events um most recently the uh fiona that water isn't just a metaphor you know it yeah. has very tangible consequences so just kind of yeah i'm in a place where i'm unpacking that yeah, <laughs> right no, now. i mean i think i mean water is is such a you know this element that um has a lot of impact in, in a lot of our diasporas. You know, I think uh, the fight for water rights in, in Mexico that, um, you know, that's been fighting all over uh, Mexico about water rights, indigenous communities fighting for water rights. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it manifests in, in, in your work too beautifully about 
how water is this kind of like unfixed thing that mm -hmm. is beautiful but also like damaging right yeah, uh, exactly. versus what we see um with the climate change and everything yeah, so that's right yeah so i mean i just just love the way you manifested mm -hmm. that in your work mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and just trying to kind of like challenge and also just i mean figuring that out through mm -hmm. making work right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so the, the role of the body is present in both of your practices, from things like subtle gestures to direct confrontations. Um, could you share some of your approaches to photographing the self in relation to the subjectivity that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm actually in a lot of my photographs, even though it's not always super um, obvious. Um, I'm thinking about a lot of the photographs with people in them or the ones that I am in as these um, performances in a way where the body itself can be a language, like the gesture itself can be a language. And I um, like perform and re-perform uh, a gesture for, for the camera. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about like what can be expressed through, through the body. Um, And I also make photographs with other people, you know, people um, either in my community or in my family or people that remind me of them. And um, yeah, I'm curious about, yeah, you have a really different relationship to photographing yourself. Yeah. In, yeah, in many images. of you don't know, like the signage work has been something that kind of is appearing in a lot of my work. Um, yeah. And yeah, and it, it's myself, like I photograph myself and I photograph in these places again that I'm kind of navigating, questioning and also having these kind of like conversations with myself uh, around this place, right? Sometimes a, a very contested place, a, you know, a place that used to be, uh, hold so many childhood memories for me and now is are gone, right? So, mm -hmm. especially with the, like this area will gentrify soon, it's, and, and, you know, sometimes I look at these um, disasters that happened in, in all over Latin America, and I realize that some of these things, like, afterwards are going to be, like, gentrified or bought up. Um, you know, we look at in New Orleans how, you know, a lot of Black folks just left because there was nothing for them afterwards, but also it's now kind of like a gentrified place that you don't belong, right, or you don't feel like you belong. Um, so part of, like, a lot of that conversation with myself is like belonging as well. Um, and again, there's, these are all kind of responses to the archive that I found and, and trying to again connect myself with, uh, you know, canonical figures um, that I do use, right? We're, you know, in academia, we've, mm -hmm. you know, both got our MFAs and, and we use that to kind of uh, as a tool to also as inspiration, but also to counter mm -hmm. uh, some of those, uh, those canonical figures. Um, and I have, you know, there's still so much to unpack about the histories that I do find. And um, I'm trying to like stop at one point because I think again, too, it's this tool is very, um, it's heavy too as well, right? Mm -hmm. Not physically as well with, with, you know, the tools I'm using, but also with the history that, that we're looking at. Um, so, I'm, you know, trying to battle that on a daily basis with using this tool, um, standing in front of these places. And again, um, you don't, and I think that's the, some of the um, connection I see with that work is we don't, we're not really showing the face, the figure, right, as a right. kind of like a placeholder for, for something that you kind of um, put yourself in, mm -hmm. and whether it be a gesture in, in your work, uh, Genesis, or looking back at some of the histories that, um, that the audience does have within a city or the diasporas within a city, right? So... Um, you know, I think I, I love the way your gestural work um, manifests. And I think you had mentioned, right, that like, where is that inspiration from the gestures? Like, where do you kind of, like, grab mm -hmm. them from or... or um... mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to, like, photo trying to photograph something that I can't actually see or find, you know, or I can't go to, um, or something that's not tangible, but maybe I can... Um, make that physical with my body for example a feeling um that i have like what does that 
you know, what does that weight feel like? Can mm-hmm. I make an image of <laughs> that weight? Mm-hmm. Um, or sometimes also, um, a lot of my photographs are made really slowly, um, as opposed to kind of responding to things that I see out in the world. So oftentimes I'll um, make note of things that I see um, and instead of kind of pulling my camera out in that moment, I, yeah, put that image in my pocket <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and just like pull from lived experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, heavily used lived experience and also sometimes not my own lived experience, but those mm-hmm. that, you know, the history that I, I'm pulling from. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot, a lot of my work also includes a lot of my family as well. Um, whether they sometimes enjoy being photographed or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's part of that, right? It's like that history is also part of, of um, and I think the whole invisible visibility thing is something that I think also connects some of that work. Um, you know, you trying to find, that gesture that you kind of put in your pocket mm-hmm. and make it visible for viewers. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, you know, that's something that I just heard you say that was uh, beautiful mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. your work. Yeah. And that connects to this picture yeah. that <laughs> I saw you make. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, no, we made, uh, Genesis helped me make this, this new work while we're in uh, Woodstock. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I was yeah. just going to say, it's really cool to make things alongside other people you know to be like working in tandem special (laughs) yeah and especially with like the the residencies that you know that we did um and uh i would give genesis rights to the river (laughs) (laughs) yeah and the the thing is like i'm i'm like so sometimes (laughs) detached from from nature you know i'm I'm a mostly city kid (laughs) um so seeing that that kind of connection with genesis work about water and um, mm. and realizing that I have way more connections to water than I thought that I did, um, and seeing that, right. So, and then I was like, well, I need some help with this work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's always great to kind of like, you know, connect with other artists and just help each other out when it comes to making work. Um, cause it I takes think, a village. Yeah. And resolving some of those questions, um, mm-hmm. you know, there must be times where we end up eating uh, some good food and Mm -hmm. just talking kind of processing our work Mm -hmm. um, because Mm -hmm. imposter syndrome is uh, Mm -hmm. really heavy (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to making some new work and just re-looking at our own work. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, So I think, and I think that's why I wanted to invite Genesis, you know, you for for this Mm -hmm. conversation of how our work relates and how we look at worlds differently as well. Mm-hmm. and borrow from from each other as well right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah totally yeah and there's something that you said about um belonging that also, yeah. also kind of ties into this theme of community that i think Lindsay was gonna touch base on. i don't know if you wanted to ask that question before or bef- but yeah, i have I something to say to <laughs> in response do you want to yeah. do you want yeah yeah you okay yeah. to talk about the found and constructed um how are we on time we have time Oh, we do okay, have yeah. time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, then let's put a pin in the thing about community and go back to it later. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, found and constructed. Yeah. Do you, can you pull up the image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I, can I ask? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go for um, it. Yeah. I feel like this question is exciting, though, because you both work with found and constructed images. Like, it, but in different ways. Um, so my question was really about speaking to how you relate to associative memory when mm. working kind of back and forth between found versus constructed photographs. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think you had mentioned like that family photo. I mean, that image that you had. Oh my What's God. That? Yeah. Of the mirrors. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> and I think, I mean, I see mirrors yeah. a lot in, in yeah. Jess's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, can you do me a favor? Can you go back to the picture where I'm in the river holding a mirror in the sun? Yeah, right there. Yeah. So um, it's interesting how images either 
in like tangible images that you see like photographs um or in a film or images from your daily experience kind of soak into you and become a part of you and and your subconscious and then kind of come out later on um i've been obsessed with this um with a few images of this uh flash that shows up in uh in mirrors um in old like vernacular family photographs and there's this one image that i made when i was nine years old it was like a self-portrait in the mirror um in puerto rico actually um i made this image as if to kind of make a record of me there in this place and i didn't know that the flash would actually look like a white blob like in the entire image and it kind of uh, became this ghost this orb that like blocked out my face so the image actually became more about my absence in a way than me trying to kind of um assert my presence there um so yeah so i think um images like that have always kind of soaked into me and end up coming out um in my work um later on and this kind of the sun i've been making a lot of pictures where i'm photographing the sun or the sun is reflecting off of um mirrors for example in this image here that's me holding a mirror shard up to the sun this kind of um like holding something that's really far away or kind of conjuring this distant thing flattening multiple perspectives like what's behind the camera what's in front of the camera can you go to the threshold yeah yeah so this one is also similar i work a lot with mirrors because of how um you can kind of like fragment space and um like create portals into other times and places um these are mirrors on the edge of the shore um, so we can see multiple perspectives and kind of like be in multiple places at once, um, which, you know, really speaks to at least my experience of kind of living in or, or just being a diasporic person. Um, it's, it's also a Rizzo print that's. Oh, yeah, there's a yes. Rizzo print. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Matarile Ediciones. Uh, H40, booth H40. <laughs> we have Rizzo prints and zines of, of that image up there. Um, but um, yeah, constructed. So with something like this, for example, where I'm working with people, um, I like saw an image somewhere of like tension being pulled. And then I like asked someone to kind of perform it with me. Um, but again, I don't think that it's like totally unrelated to the image of the mirrors, even though the process is really different, the, there's always this kind of um, what's in the frame of the camera, what's outside of the frame of the camera, and like a kind of tension or things being pulled in multiple directions. Um, can you go to the other? Oh, never mind. It's not there. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, yeah, things being pulled in multiple directions or sometimes coming together too. Um, I thought there was this other image in there of things coming together, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Is, is that, yeah. that image somewhere else that maybe the audience can see it later on? Oh yeah. It's yeah. on my website. It's just an image of, um, photographs taped on a window that I found. Mm -hmm. Um, and the images were taped and retaped over and over again. And they kept kind of like ripping and falling apart, but the people, um, kept kind of meticulously bringing them back together and insisting on their togetherness. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. What about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I find these these images that I, I. It took me a while to sometimes find these images of of you know these archives that I um, discovered in my small little archival location mm -hmm. called the Anaheim Heritage Center. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I, like I mentioned, I sometimes don't like to show these images um, and then try to create, right? So the images of the signage work is the response to it and the staking the claim to that, to that history, to those kind of like past histories. Um, 
What about the other pictures that you make in Anaheim? Do you ever pull from archival images when you're making those, not just the signage work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think most of the time when I ask folks about a portrait, if, if where is the place they want to take the portrait, it's usually always these kind of places like um, this one on the right, where it's, mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest parks in the city. Mm. And most people, like, I ask them, where do you want this image, you know, from a memory or from, you know, something that, you know, a baptism party they had when they were younger. <laughs> so they take me to this location, which again has this kind of weird, um, it's always like this tug and pull, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, before making the images, these places are super contested. Um, this park to the right, it was segregated. Uh, in 2016, there was like a KK rally there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have all these memories from families you know, mostly Mexican-American families, uh, Central American families that come and party there, that come and play soccer there. Uh, so this is like a, a very weird internal tug and pull because mm -hmm. there's a lot of joyous moments in those in those places, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's beautiful images to be made as well, right? There's a lot of family photographs that I do have um, with, you know, my brother's like first communion or or, you know, the wedding photos got taken there a lot too. So hmm. there's a lot of joy within that too, right? So, and that's the thing I'm trying to kind of pull forward, right? There's, there's these kind of histories battling each other and I'm mm -hmm. like trying to introduce the new one, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. kind of restaging the rememory of these, these happy moments, mm -hmm. um, even despite that, you know, this colonized place in, in my city did not have that for us, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these locations everywhere I'm I'm always thinking about like and I always research this these places where I go and take images. It's um and I find out these kind of histories. But again, I wanna kind of like put forth these happy memories uh as a way to contradict some of the, you know, this this kid is is in a place where only he can go, only, you know, uh, Mexican Americans can kind of navigate in that park. Mm hmm Um mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so and in, in the book, you know, I include some of these these um, poems and, and images, um, again, because, you know, the book is a very personal thing, too. Um, you know, it's not being displayed on the wall, but mm -hmm. it's also much a, a kind of more interpersonal yeah, uh, conversation. Yeah, in a hand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hair so it's so. kind of like how you're going to be holding your family photos or graphs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if anyone's not from, like, New York, you go back home and you hold those photographs like mm -hmm. a book, like mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with the very like 90s kitschy mm -hmm. <laughs> family album. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why I'm always like going back and, and borrowing from family photographs. Mm. Um, yeah. And what's interesting too about like seeing um, photographs made in different times and by different people of the same place um, is that it really like for me, like thinking when like when I look at your publication, it just reminds me of the slipperiness of photography, mm -hmm. right? And the subjectivity of yeah. it and how there's only so much that we can yeah. describe with and and how the photograph is image. also <laughs> unfixed. It's not yeah. Right. One of yeah. the things in school that they always we, we always teach is like the photograph is not evidence, maybe, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. we always try to question that. And yeah. I think, um, you know, a lot of the work that we're trying to make is is finding the fluidity within that photograph mm -hmm. and its history mm -hmm. and imagining new, mm -hmm. you know, I think my, the title of my series is, like, possibilities, like, the, the mm -hmm. possibilities that, that photographs can create mm -hmm. um, in our hands and in our way of, of you know, having folks perform these kind of gestures and um, these conversations that we have with whoever is sitting for the photograph, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if it's ourselves, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I think we're also kind of like included in some of those, those talks, those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and no, I think, um, it, and it's funny how like a lot of my family photographs, like um, I'm the one that took them mm -hmm. and I kind of just started being like the family photographer. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's several ones of that mirror image with the flash on, you know, you get your Kodak hmm. camera, yeah. uh, you forget the flash is on, right. or you just think that the flash didn't do something cool. Mm -hmm. um, but then you disappear within that image mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and you're not there, you're invisible too, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us had had 10 year old minds mm -hmm. thinking of like your place in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the photograph does that, right?
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I, I think it's a good place to um, ask you a last question. Yeah. And then we can open up for some Q&A. But there's so much we could talk about. I feel like both your practices are really rich in terms of the way in which you approach subjectivity. Um, but a central component is how you approach community. Um, what is that sensibility for you? Mm -hmm. So if you could just talk about the importance of community within your practices, that would be great. Yeah, and I think um, when Genesis mentioned like the slowing down part is, is something that was very essential to the work that I'm doing now is slowing down. I spent seven years as a documentary photographer, photojournalist. Mm. Um, it really took a toll on me because it was just the fastness, pace, um, the non-deciding, you know, who was deciding to put my images where. Um, so community has been very, and I came back, right? I was in Chicago, I was living away, mm -hmm. and I came back to my community because I think I wanted to slow down and I wanted to kind of really dig into some of those histories that I missed as a kid. Um, so a lot of the you know the the reaching out i do is is through these kind of simple tasks of old friends really slowing down i shoot medium large format you know there's there's this slowness and these conversations that i do have with a lot of um the folks that i'm, I'm photographing so just kind of that slowness but also um you know the conversations we do have and the acceptance to be photographed is something that has um, been so much um i think better for me to kind of make an image mm -hmm. um, because again, I'm not parachuting in, I'm not, you know, and some of these, even though, uh, you know, I was raised in this community, I still ask permission to kind of go into other neighborhoods that I, you know, they didn't grow up to. Right. So, uh, I mean, I think that's why sometimes this project has been ongoing for almost five years. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so much more to continue, but also the community there is is really responding to it and asking, you know, tell me their story. Um, mm. You know, can you kind of continue some of these these histories that like I want to be part of uh, in the whole essence of of the city too? Yeah, I wonder if your time as a journalist and documentary photographer like did that influence wanting a slower approach with your picture making? Yeah, I mean, I think usually seeing how communities of color were being represented mm -hmm. uh, in some of these spaces that I was photographing really kind of impacted the way I was looking as myself, as, as this person with a tool, with a camera that, uh, you know, we go in, you know, if there's undergrads here, grad students, like we go in thinking that the photograph is, is this um, powerful thing and it is, but I think it was, I was a little bit jaded to think that, you know, photographing conflict and photographing like a lot of trauma was something that can kind of push that policy over, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to feel like we we're represented more, not just like a simple representation of a person in a photograph is, is nothing, right? So I wanted to kind of go beyond that. And it's always having to deal with history, be part of that, that kind of process as well mm -hmm. again staking a claim to a community that they didn't really see us mm -hmm. um and you know we we're just kind of on the other side of of this lens walls right so so community has been super important i think i i ask every time if, if there's always um you know something i could do better when it comes to photographing mm -hmm. some, someone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think i you know i want to see your kind of how community kind of come up Comes yeah, up in your work. yeah. Well, it's interesting because when I think about community in relationship to my work, I think a lot about place and the first question that we were unpacking. Um, and I think about, um, and belonging too. That's mm -hmm. why when you brought up belonging, I was like, ding, 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 community. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you can't necessarily belong to a place or to a geographic mm -hmm. place, how can you then instead conjure belonging with, people or between people or can a place be conjured between people <laughs> if that <laughs> makes a sense um or can people become a place i mean i'm thinking about her i mean personally speaking i feel i inherited a relationship to place specifically to puerto rico from um in large part not exclusively but in large part through like the matrilineal bonds um, and relationships in my family. So um, 
you know, that line between like a geographic place and a specific community or group of people kind of gets blurred for me. So, um, yeah, yeah. So when I'm making photographs with people, um, they're either people that I know or people that I meet and then kind of cast and stage these scenes with. Um, things are made very slowly and I make things over and over and over again. The picture on the right, I made this like six times over two years <laughs> um, using myself, using other people, using friends in a studio and public space. And so I, I work really, really slowly um, and kind of set a, cer a, uh, set a certain uh, parameter, like the gesture. Okay. Lily, you tell Brianna the whisper, and then the rest becomes this improvisation where we're all kind of playing, to be honest with you. And um, I think that making things from a place of improvisation and and play <laughs> is is important to me. Um, and everyone like seems to be having like some kind of yeah. There's joy in the process, mm -hmm. um, which is important. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's super important to to think about joy in, in, in photography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, again, could just trying to counter a lot of that history um, that we see in photography and in diaspora communities too, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, like you don't have to re-traumatize yourself while making the work. Like the work yeah. can come can happen from a place of like joy and can still, yeah, like be in conversation with <laughs> things that are not joyful, right? But um, you know, yeah. curiosity um and yeah, and experimentation yeah. and play are all very valid. Yeah, I mean, I think mm -hmm. from the decision to kind of go back and stop doing that other work that I was doing for six years is like I was re-traumatizing myself mm -hmm. so much that, it, you know, I didn't think that photography had that space to kind of bring in joy and, and bring in acceptance. Because mm -hmm. um, even that for me was a step like, it, you know, not being in people's faces when mm -hmm. something was traumatic was happening, but it's stepping back mm -hmm. and being like, I can have these joyous moments with my community um, while making an image with them, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's probably like a um, a good note to end it with. Like for a lot of the students that we do have, maybe here is like mm -hmm. you, you. There is that space of joys that you can have with mm -hmm. with photography. Um, and if you're mm -hmm. like trouble having making work, like think about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, totally. Yeah, and also I just wanted to add really quickly. I know we have to go to Q and A, but also. Um, the way that um, I feel like the photographs to like create a sense of community, like the, the almost like the, the imagined community, mm -hmm. like these are people that like are not related to me by blood, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, there's something maybe about um, how they're photographed or like a proximity or something that um, feels like they could be maybe, I'm unsure if, if, if that's clear, but um yeah, that I I just want to kind of clarify that yeah, like some of the people in my photographs are people from my community, and then other times I'm like imagining and kind of creating these like imagined or communities or communities I may long for, um, and that like the photograph can maybe also like be in place of of a of a desire or mm -hmm. you know of an absence too. Thank you both. Okay. Um, I think we have time for Q&A mm -hmm. yeah. and there are mics if anyone has questions. I have one. Oh, sure. Thanks. Hey, how's it going? My Hi. name is Eddie. Um, I'm a really big fan of both of your guys' work and have been for a really long time, so I appreciate this and thank, thank you, you for putting this on. Um, I know you talked a lot about community and kind of how it relates to family, but I'm kind of curious how your family has either inspired or interacted with the work or maybe has um, influenced the work in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. Because as like, I guess, kids in the diaspora, right, we learn a lot of things about our family, what we don't want to be, what we want to be, mm -hmm. um, and kind of how that's influenced your work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that for my work, it was just kind of coming back and, and seeing a lot of the old family photographs um, that I took that I didn't know I took. Um, and also, I think in, in the rest of my work, there is like a lot of images with my father and my mother. 
uh, because I think including them as part of, you know, they're part of that history too, right? They're part of that new history of, of the city that I belong to. Um, and I think that's kind of been a huge inspiration for me too. Uh, you know, as diaspora kids, like uh, my father has been photographed maybe like a hundred times for me and it gets kind of like, for him, it gets a little tiresome, but then to see that kind of um, in, in one of the images, there is a, uh, an image of my brother cutting my dad's hair mm -hmm. um, like we did back in when we were kids, right? Um, and I think seeing those gestures, seeing like my brother again coming back and, and me coming back home and, and having that moment, that tender moment uh, with him was something special. Um, and now he, he enjoys being photographed like quite a bit. My mother is a little more like kind of like shy and like, you know, there's a thing one parent that sometimes is like, no, no, me tome photos, you know, like, um, mm. but there's those tender moments that I think I remember the most when I capture them. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of relate back to my family photographs of those kind of joyous moments that we do have with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I make pictures with my family, but or, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes I make pictures with people who may remind me of them or not. So it's a bit of a mix. But um, I do want to say that it was through photography that I feel I initially um kind of uh or hmm not exclusively through photography but photographs helped me understand like i first saw puerto rico through photographs you know um and to see these pictures and be like oh i belong to this you know like that was quite impactful for me so um but when i'm yeah when i'm photographing hmm, i think it's really interesting that it almost becomes like a ritual, right? Like these are people I don't live close to or like, or like I can't live close to. So when we are together, it feels um, like a ritual to be able to make something together that the, uh, like the event of photographing, like the before the picture is made is something. <laughs> and then the picture itself, it's its own universe. And then after that, um, you know, the way that the photograph circulates or then the context shifts um and the, and so does the meaning um i loved um i recently made a zine with matarile ediciones and um i love that it was being mailed to people and i loved checking the tracking and seeing that it was like in my aunt's mailbox <laughs> in in puerto rico and how that i don't know that's like a way to um remain connected that like the art making process or like picture making process, not just the images can be a way to remain connected. But in terms of what they think of the pictures, they think all kinds of things of the pictures, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi, William. Um, thank you for this conversation. Um, I guess I'm really interested in the performativity of photography and the performativity of um, your images that mm -hmm. sometimes you both make. And so I guess I'm interested, like what happens? And then also the result, like the stillness of the photograph, right? So it's like this product or this thing. And so I'm thinking more about like what happens to the performance mm -hmm. um, after the image or, um, before the image. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in, yeah, so I'm thinking mm -hmm. about that. Oh, I'm really excited <laughs> about this question. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I'm i more so excited about photography <laughs> and how when you put a frame around something and you freeze it, it completely transforms, right? Like suddenly I'm not seeing like the whole scene of the kitchen. I'm not seeing, you know, the person's expression. I'm not seeing this. It suddenly becomes something different. Um, um yeah yeah so like the like the performance feels like the seed or something that yeah then but then the 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 performance itself and um the photograph feel really different like when i look at the picture i'm like whoa i can't believe that looked like that in that 125th of a second in mm -hmm. that moment from that perspective <laughs> you know because like the experience of being there and like what it looked like is like totally different like can you actually can you go to the picture of the string um uh yeah that one like this was so chaotic mm -hmm. to make like that 
blue thing was like a curtain. My camera battery was dying. Like I was like, I need something blue. I like ripped the curtain. I broke the curtain rod. I had 3% left on my battery. Like (laughs) it was like, it was such a scene. (laughs) Um, But then, and then like photography, it just transformed everything, you know, and I'm excited about about that right how this was something that existed but through the act of being photographed it's completely transformed into another place (laughs) we could i mean you can ask her we could chat (laughs) yeah that's that's amazing to see like you know that i mean for me too i think there's these image i mean especially the signage work where i'm doing this stuff in public space it's yeah i've gotten yelled at so many times Mm -hmm. but i think that moment that it that that we do kind of capture right and you know sometimes i'm like this i got two more shots on this you know 10 shot roll mm-hmm. um becomes this kind of imagined place that i'm kind of like thinking right that i'm mm-hmm. like this is a, a a moment that i did capture in that kind of imagined world that we kind of try to create with photography um uh, where none of that other stuff you know none of the kind of racist folks being like gentrification is good like fuck you you know mm-hmm. um and again, it's kind of like those two comings of like histories of the past, the present, and like the the future possibilities where, you know, we exist. Um, and I think that's why I think that tool, the the photograph, and and part of that performance is kind of like imagine those futures, um, mm-hmm. you know, along with a lot of you know whatever I'm making with the signage work. But yeah, there's been a lot of stuff that happens before and after. Um, even with the, the images of my dad, it's like, um, you know, my dad wasn't happy with his haircut <laughs> after my brother, t- <laughs> like he like messed it up. But, you know, I think in that moment was this kind of imagined space that, that we hold dear to ourselves. And I think that's what the photograph can do, mm-hmm. right? Kind of like filter out these other nuances, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. up into the photograph is made and then afterwards too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, just a super quick follow up too. I mean, it makes me think of like Pope L's performances, like the crawl performances and how they, I mean, transform, right. Versus like being in Times Square and watching Pope L crawl versus like seeing a video of him crawling versus seeing a still photograph of him crawling. Right. And like how different all of those are. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's something that you want. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hello. Uh, Genesis, I'm a big fan of your work, been a big fan <laughs> of your work for, for 30 Hi, brother. years now. <laughs> Hi, brother. <laughs> Family. Um, I had a question, um, uh, really something else said about uh, photography as tool and um thinking about the material that you work with um your work as a journalist and <clears throat> your work as an artist how those two differ um regarding this the idea of the the liber like tools liberatory tools um but also the liberation of the tool itself if that makes sense, really thinking about photography as a tool for uh, journalistic work versus photography as a tool for what you're doing here and how this work feeds back into that, uh, how you continue to use that tool um, for liberatory projects. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think... Again, like, you know, I mean, if anyone's taken like a history of photography class, we know this this tool has kind of the very kind of colonial imperialist tool. Um, and and it hasn't done a lot of damage till today, right? You know, the, the way um, during Black Lives Matter, people were finding out, like getting, you know, arrested because they found photographs of that, you know, person being you know, destroying the police car, right? So... Um, I think it, it all has to do back with, for me, at least the, the kind of autonomy that I, I do hold while making images mm-hmm. versus the the non-autonomy that I was holding to my editors for newspapers, right? Like mm-hmm. editors who were not living in the city, they were kind of living in the suburbs, not really experiencing um, what was happening in, in the neighborhoods. Um, 
but again, it's so like I'm still always still um, talking to myself, arguing with myself if this if I should even continue making images with mm-hmm. this tool because mm-hmm. right we can't really you know bring down the master's house with the master's tool. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's always this kind of inner conversation I do have, and I think um, I am seeing a lot more work by amazing artists that use this tool and, and are still trying to kind of hopefully destroy this the history of this um this tool and kind of imagine a new uh, a new story with these tools right um and i think that's what a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the people that i admire are, are doing with that tool um i think it's still quite a ways out right because mm-hmm. we're still seeing you know now there's like you know better phones to hmm. uh, capture like darker skin etc but i think as soon as we try to take a step forward we always take a step back as well mm-hmm. uh, but it's a challenge to kind of always keep making work with this tool uh, mm-hmm. if, and i think if you're question if you're not questioning yourself about this tool and its history like i think maybe changing medium might be a, a way that i hmm. thought was i was going to do right but mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to add quickly, because I know we're short on time, but also like the aftermath, like the afterlife of the image. It's like, once you've made the image, like where are these images circulating? Like how, like, you know, are they, are they being sold? Where are they being sold? Like, what are they, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Who's seeing them? Who has access to them? Right. That it's not just, I don't think you can, that's like a lot to expect from one image, right? right. To like liberate through an image. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can do that personally in my two cents <laughs> alone. But yeah, I yeah. think that like the image itself can be, you know, can be like, it's like what you do with it afterwards. Yeah. Right? yeah. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you, you all for the questions. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank <laughs> We hit time. Bad Bunny karaoke? Uh, yeah. Bad Bunny karaoke. Oh my God.
Okay. Okay. Hold on. Okay, so, uh, sí, creo que podemos eh, empezar. Y sí. Tal vez tú lo puedes dirigir un poco, Pablo, eh, hasta que lo conecto, Pablo. Sí, sí. sí. Ok. Eh, hi, hello. Eh, shall we do this in English or in Spanish? Either. Ok. Eh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks, Printed Mother and the classroom, David Senior for open this space uh, for us. Uh, we are thrilled to have the, this conversation uh, starting from uh, the recent publication uh, we made along with Terminal, uh, this little booklet titled uh, Manual para realizar exposiciones en el trópico o Manual for Exhibition Making in the Tropics by Pablo León de la Barra. Um, Are with us uh, Jaime Núñez del Arco uh, from Quito, Ecuador, from Terminal, Camilo Otero uh, from Calypso Press, now based in New York, Josefina y Camila from Hambre, 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 Hambre from Santiago de Chile. Um, we, we wanted to link uh, this publication uh, written by Pablo Leon de la Barra, who, which is about to connect at any moment. Uh, which is focused mostly on the art practices uh, in the tropics, which uh, I think this needs a disambiguation, uh, the sense of the tropics, more related with the Brazilian construction of that concept, uh, but what we could call here the global south, if that's uh, possible uh, as a space to, <coughs> to define this. Uh, Pablo did this uh, little manifesto about 10 years ago, uh, related uh, with his practice as a curator, uh, working in many spaces outside of the global circuits uh, of art, uh, no, the North global circuits of art. And uh, we felt that uh, what uh, on the manual is written could easily be translated to our practices as a publishers uh, in Latin America. No? So that's the sense of the conversation. Uh, and first, uh, why we could start by reading the, the, the manual, which is very short. Uh, why don't we read it both in English and Spanish? Uh, I can read it in English and maybe one of us could do this in Number one, the tropics is a state of mind, a different perce perception of a space, time, geography that resists neoliberalism, efficiency, overproduction, overconsumption, and overaccumulation. El trópico es un estado mental, una percepción diferente del espacio, del tiempo y de la geografía que se resiste a la eficiencia, a la superproducción, al exceso de consumo y a la sobreacumulación del neoliberalismo. Number two. <coughs> Do exhibitions everywhere, in white cubes, in black cubes, in wooden cubes, in green cubes, in the jungle and floating in the river, in abandoned spaces and in spaces to be built, in the internet, in pages of books or of magazines or inside a film, in the streets or empty lots, or in visible exhibitions. Hacer exposiciones en cualquier parte, en cubos blancos, en cubos negros, en cubos de madera y en cubos verdes, en la selva y flotando en el río en espacios abandonados y en espacios por construir, en internet y en páginas de libros o revistas o dentro de una película, en la calle o en terrenos baldíos, o exposiciones invisibles. Number three, learn, learn from non-art museums. Instead, go to community museums, dormant museums, ethnographic museums, folkloric museums, mineral museums, botanical gardens. Aprender de museos no artísticos. En cambio, ir a museos comunitarios, museos inactivos, museos etnográficos, museos folclóricos, museos minerales, jardines botánicos. 
Think of the exhibition number four. Think of the exhibition as a process, not as a final perfect static result. Pensar la exposición como un proceso, no como un resultado acabado, perfecto, estático. Number five. Create flexible exhibitions where things can always change. Crear exposiciones flexibles donde las cosas siempre puedan cambiar. Number six. Think of the exhibition not as an accumulation of objects, but as a way to researching histories, ideas, and contexts. Think, think, of, the say, think of the exhibition as an essay written with words instead, written with works instead of words. Pensar la exposición no como una acumulación de objetos, sino como un modo de investigar historias, ideas y contextos. Pensar la exposición como un ensayo crítico, como un ensayo escrito con obras en lugar de palabras. Number seven, exhibit works of art as well as, as, well as things that are not works of art. Include research and documents and photocopies. Exhibir obras de arte, tanto como cosas que no sean obras de arte. Incluir investigación y documentos y fotocopias. Number eight, integrate new works during the exhibition, disappear others. Integrar nuevas obras durante la exposición, desaparecer otras. Number nine, I learned from two, two, two pioneer curators before the procession as such existed, working during the 50s and 70s, that doing an exhibition is like installing a nativity. You have to put the different figures in, di in dialogue with each other. Aprendí de dos curadores pioneros que trabajan en los años 50 y 60, antes de la profesión existiera como tal. Que hacer una exposición es como armar un pesebre. Hay que poner las distintas figuras a dialogar entre sí. Number 10. Allow errors, surprises and collaborations to happen within the exhibition. Permitir que ocurran errores. Sorpresas y colaboraciones dentro de la exposición. Number 11. Allow the, spectator, the spectators to become part of the exhibition, to activate it and become a, participat, a participator or even an exhibitor. Permitir que los espectadores se vuelvan parte de la exposición, que la activen y se conviertan en participantes o incluso en expositores. Number 12. Think of the exhibition as a place where things could happen, a place for experiments and experiences. Pensar la exposición como un lugar donde pueden pasar cosas, un lugar de experimentos y experiencias. Number 13. Allow the exhibition to become a place or a non-place, a scenario, a landscape, a park, a library, a discussion forum, a party, a social club. Permitir que la exposición se vuelva un lugar o un no lugar, un escenario, un paisaje, un parque, una biblioteca, un foro de debate, una fiesta, un club social. Number 14. Plants and hammock and fans and plastic chairs and mosquito nets always make an exhibition a better place. Las plantas y las hamacas, ventiladores y sillas de plástico, telas en el mosquitero, siempre hacen de la exposición un lugar mejor. Number 15. Build display structures and cabinets and tables and moving walls to exhibit things. Construir estructuras y cajoneras y mesas y paredes móviles para exhibir cosas. Number 16. Design the exhibition without specifying every detail on the sign. Suggest instead, instead what might happen. Diseñar la exposición sin especificar todos los detalles. En cambio, desdiseñar. Sugerir lo que podría pasar. Number 17. Find inspiration on people's everyday design solution. Learn from how people display information and products in real life. Learn from street, street posts and people selling in the street. Buscar inspiración en las soluciones del diseño cotidianas de la gente. Aprender de cómo la gente exhibe información y productos en la vida real. Aprender de los anuncios callejeros y de los vendedores ambulantes. Number 18. Use copies, reproductions, printed, printed JPGs, and photocopies taped to the wall if you can't have access to the original work. Usar copias, reproducciones, JPGs impresos y fotocopias pegadas a la pared si no se puede tener acceso a la obra original. Number 19. Do exhibition posters, pamphlets, PDFs, photocopy catalogs, or, inter or internet blogs or sites. Allow for the circulation of the ideas and images generated by the exhibition. 
hacer pósters, folletos, PDFs, fotocopiar catálogos o blogs o sitios de internet, favorecer la circulación de ideas e imágenes generadas por la exposición. Number 20. Don't be afraid of exhibition labels. Your public will thank you for explaining your thoughts, even if they disagree. No tener miedo de las cédulas de exposición. El público agradecerá que se le expliquen ideas, incluso si no está de acuerdo con ellas. Number 21. When there's no budget, trust in the economy of friendship. Cuando no hay presupuesto, confiar en la economía de la amistad. Number 22. Use what you have at hand. Usar lo que se tenga a mano. And finally, number 23. Let the unexpected happen. Dejar que lo inesperado ocurra. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the motto of this uh, talk because uh, uh, we can't connect with Pablo, with it's mm -hmm. the author, but um, uh, I wanted to um, use uh, this time to uh, explain a little bit how this, uh, first of all, how this uh, publication uh, came to life. Um, Pablo León de la Barra, I don't know if you uh, know him or have heard of him, but it's a, a very well-known uh, contemporary art uh, curator uh, from Mexico City. He has made uh, his career uh, mostly in Brazil. And um, I found uh, this manifesto uh, a long time ago, ago, like just making the rounds on the internet. And, um, and before I met him, I always uh, read that manifesto permanently all the time. And um, well, after when I, um, afterwards I met him and talked to him and uh, then I uh, talked with my friend Leon to uh, make, uh, transform uh, this manifesto uh, on a book. And it uh, speaks uh, to me and I guess to all of us uh, a lot because uh, we are publishers, I'm based in Ecuador, you know, um, and um, Daniela and Camila are, are based in Chile, and Camilo is, uh, was based in Cali, <laughs> in Colombia, and uh, Leon is based in Mexico City, as some of uh, you might know, and uh, it's, um, as, As you might guess, it's, it's uh, complicated. In a way, we have to work a lot to be able to be here, you know, with our work, uh, with our books, and to be able to travel and take a huge risk to, uh, to sell our stuff here. And um, so we were uh, truly uh, excited and interested to uh, invite our friends here uh, so we can in the few minutes that we have to talk a little bit about our practice and how we manage to, to do what we do, you know? So um, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe Daniela and Camila can uh, speak a little bit about what, what, what you do. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Camila. This is Daniela Josefina. We are both part of AMBRE, which means hunger. Uh, we are a lesbian publishing initiative from Santiago, Chile. Um, we like to explore feminist design on conventional formats. Um, we mostly print, for example, in black, black ink digitally because in our country, for example, Riso uh, is super expensive. So, um, We've been making choices since 2019 to keep publishing, uh, making zines, collaborating with artists and writers from Latin America, and basically doing it just as the publication that Leon and Daniela read is to use what we have at hand, um, the um, strategies of our local territories, We keep learning and collaborating with others. Um, and basically that, yeah, just kind of um, doing what we have at hand and acting urgently, also depending on the context that we are in. 
Um, for example, today in, in our booth at age 45, we'll be launching this publication called Acción Gráfica Urgente. And in a way it like synthesizes a lot of our, also like our way of understanding publishing also related to our context, publishing from a feminist and political perspective. And as the name says, Acción Gráfica Urgente, or Urgent Graphic Action, um, this was a way of using publishing during the social uprising in Chile in 2019 to just kind of act urgently, collect, uh, collaborate with others and create like safe, queer, tender spaces to um, use graphic activism, paper, and basically all the tools that we had to um, amplify what was happening in the streets too in Chile. And a little bit of that, um, we could, I think we could go in a lot into what our practices are, but I think it could be nice that we could keep talking a little bit more and seeing like what are the points that we have in common and maybe which we don't depending on the context that we are in. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me something. Or, or, no, no, no. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how, how to connect Pablo. Sorry. sorry. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, well, I, I wanted uh, Camilo to, to explain uh, a little bit uh, your work that uh, you've been, um, you know, working as Calypso Press uh, from Cali, Colombia uh, for many years now. And now you recently moved to New York you know, to uh, keep your uh, publishing work here. So it will be uh, amazing to learn a little bit. How did you make that uh, jump? And what are maybe your expectations as, as a Latin American, uh, you know, uh, author <laughs> and artist uh, here in the city? Yeah, great. thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I, together with my partner, Eva Parra, we have a publishing studio called Calypso Press. We started in 2015 in Colombia, in Cali. And um, we, like, like, contrary to their uh, experience, uh, we br bought a risograph machine in a place where um, it didn't, like, no one had a risograph machine. And that was like, it was interesting because little by little, um, the Risograph community started and other publishers, other people acquired theirs. And it's interesting how um, to see this community grow and it makes things easier for publishers to, to develop. So in the end, it's a very precarious and, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a structure that relies on collaboration and um, other people. But um, yeah, so I've been we've been publishing for for seven years. We we moved for reasons that don't really have to do with our publishing project. So it's not like we wanted to come to New York to uh, be in the New York scene or anything. It's just like other situations in life, but. Um, the interesting thing is that um, connected to the to the manual and to this whole idea of not not only um, uh, curating or doing exhibitions in the tropics, but um, producing in the tropics. Uh, I think it's really interesting how. Uh, you as a producer or as a as a publisher you have to come to terms with the dynamics and with the logics of production in the country and in the city so um there is not well there is uh there is a tradition of uh screen printing and um like uh fine press since the 70s, 60s and 70s in Cali, but uh, there isn't really a tradition of publications uh, and uh, publishing in the city. 
Um, it really, since the early 2000s, some independent publishers in other areas of the country started um, uh, emerging. And the scene has grown like in the last 20 years. So really all the publishers and print, uh, sorry, all the printers and, and yeah, and publishers were either commercial or um, they came for, uh, from other realms. And it's been very interesting to, you know, learn, but also uh, come to terms with the way they produce and uh, the way we intend or want things to happen. I think like this whole subject of the, of producing in the tropics is, it's a very, uh, you know, extensive and long um, subject. And it has to do with dynamics and way people think and think and act and live. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm not really sure what perception uh, the people here in the public are <laughs> getting from this idea in the sense that I feel it's really easy to romanticize or to uh, make a cliche out of uh, a precarious situation. But it does have, I mean, there are many reasons why it's very interesting to be in that context and to be in this um, hustle, if you want to call it, um, because it makes for a collaborative construction of your work. So in the end, our production, we might have this image or brand called Calypso Press, or I guess Gato Negro or Ambre, but in, uh, in the end, there are so many people supporting you in many different ways small workshops uh, and the like the learning process and the working with those uh, other agents are also part of what you are able to see on our tables today. Yeah. And um, yeah, yo quiero complementar un poco lo que, uh, what Camilo is uh, saying. Uh, for example, my, imprint uh, which is called terminal and it's uh, based in quito in the ecuadorian highlands and um we have had like we've been working like maybe since uh 2019 so it's a uh, very like new you know and um when we started um we made a research of how to it, i mean probably like the better way to print and to bring your stuff uh, outside our country, you know, and um, we learned the hard way uh, that some things are truly uh, complicated. For example, uh, post, you know, post mail, and it's truly expensive. So uh, sometimes it's uh, cheaper that you fly with a package of books than just to send the books, you know. For example, uh, in Ecuador, which is, of course, a very small country, you know, uh, we don't have postal service anymore. There's no postal service in the country because the government decided to shut it down because it costs too much for them, you know. So, I mean, you can only use, for example, DHL or FedEx and nothing else. And maybe to ship a piece of paper, like an A4 paper, costs like thirty dollars. You know, so that's like you can't work like that. So you have to figure out stuff uh, like that, and um, just to work with uh, friends and use these uh, collaborative situations that you develop with, uh, you know, with people from you know, other imprints or other publishing houses or uh, spaces like fairs. And the other thing that it's uh, important to think about, it's uh, something Camilo said that, um, and Camila said too, that for example, um, many people print uh, in 
independent circles or publishing circles, for example, in with uh, Rizzo, you know, and here in the States, you know, it's really easy to do that. And even in Mexico, for example, uh, Leon works a lot with Rizzo. Uh, but for example, in our country, that's uh, unexistent. You know, there's maybe one Rizzo machine in the whole country, you know, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, and it's not like, you know, I mean, it's not something weird. It's just that this studio of designers and printers that they bought the Rizzo, you know, and they print with Rizzo and, and it's, uh, they, do, they do an amazing work, you know. But uh, at the same time, we thought that this is not, not us in a way, you know, and uh, we, will, we won't try to push to print uh, on systems that don't work with us in our location where we are located. So uh, lately, we've been uh, working with uh, loads of small printers, you know, like very decades old printers that right now uh, they're suffering a lot because there's like these huge digital big uh, printing services that uh, they don't have any more work. So we've been like talking to a lot of these people, sometimes very old people like to, uh, and help them to understand what we do and help us with print our books. So that way we, uh, we do our, our share of helping that small community and uh, help them thrive in a way. And the last thing I want to say is that um, our uh, terminal is committed to, to work with uh lot of artists and visual artists from Ecuador uh, and well we, we work now with uh, more people for from uh, the Caribbean and near countries but um, it's sometimes really difficult to access uh, fairs like print matter fair for example mm -hmm. for an artist you know and uh, so uh, we in a way try to print stuff uh, and bring stuff Uh, from amazing people that otherwise they wouldn't have the opportunity to show their work here. And um, so, um, yeah, it's a really collaborative situation. Uh, so I don't know, it's your turn. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I, I would like to add one two or three things to this discussion. Um, Uh, and somehow to also to point uh, uh, that also can be very problematic uh, put ourselves in this position not to somehow self exotize our practice <laughs> and uh, 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 and yes the, 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 the I think the value of uh, of Pablo's text is that uh, resumes very punctually and boldly uh, a set of strategies to operate and make possible the circulation of cultural contents in an adverse uh, context, no? uh, where uh, you have to, or you have the opportunity to dissolve uh, hierarchies, you have to, the opportunity to demonetize relations, you have the need to build a community around what you do. Uh, 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 but many times, um, uh, because of this, uh, sometimes the process becomes more important than the content. Um, And um, I, I don't know, in our practice in Catonegro Ediciones, we've been doing this for the, it's going to be 10 years. Uh, and indeed, we started like uh, this practice to trying to find the easiest way to get into a book uh, and getting rid of everything what is not necessary. Uh, uh, but somehow everyone here operates uh, like uh, somehow in a simulacro, in a simulacrum of, a, uh, of what a possible economy of this uh, could be, no? Um, and, uh, and also, for, for, for example, uh, uh, and that's something that we have dealt with this uh, for many years. Uh, we've been doing first abroad Mexico for many years and uh, Uh, and somehow uh, understanding what kind of role we play in a space like this, no? Uh, and uh, first of all, it was because we found here a set of interlocutions that uh, was not available in our context. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, we realized that somehow we were playing here a role. Uh, 
like the exotic role, like uh, the, the, the this sense of condescence of, oh, you come from Mexico, oh, you have books, there. <laughs> there are many problems there. <laughs> uh, and you brought our problems to sell it with you and so somehow trying to find a link of empathy with that. Uh, but, uh, and that's a, a contradiction that we don't try to solve anymore, no? in terms of, uh, yeah, it's something, it's very difficult to, 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 to build, a, um, I don't know the word in English, a, a kind of practice that doesn't inhabitate many contradictions based on this kind of economy. No? Uh, but uh, something that we have learned is, uh, is that uh, it uh, should be, at least for us, should be important to, 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 to try to put the emphasis on the content and not necessarily on the process, even though the process is so important because the process builds your readership and builds your community where you belong to. But uh, what should talk about uh, what we do is, is the content. And in that sense, uh, uh, somehow this set of strategies uh, uh, to make possible uh, uh, bring contents to a format of circulation and meaning, which is a book or a printed thing, um, uh, it's the possibility to yes, to, to, to invert uh, these relations center periphery of the circulation of that given content. Because yes, it's true that uh, is in many ways and in many very compelling ways, uh, what's happening in our context, it's more important for everyone, mostly for our communities, than, than what is happening some other, some other places. Because there are survival things going on around that. And, the, and the, the ways to reflect, to build memory, to problematize that, uh, are more urgent, as uh, Camila said, no? And, um, uh, 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 and somehow what we've been trying is uh, by understanding this set of strategies, but uh, somehow to subvert uh, this, uh, this relation center periphery and make the, the, the point that um, in many ways the, the center is some other place, uh, we, if any, no? And uh, well, that, that's a... A reflection I wanted to, to share with you, uh, but I would like to ask uh, Camila Josefina that you went through a couple of months ago. You were invited to Documenta, and uh, uh, where I can imagine that's why I'm asking. Uh, all these questions were put in place in a very interesting context. I don't know if you can share that experience with us. Mm -hmm. Actually, the invitation from Documenta comes before our graphic activism. So the way we put on the public space the graphics made by collective ways uh, give us the opportunity to share with uh, like 20 publishers from all around the world our practice and resistance ways to keep going even where where we don't have money, we don't have paper, you know, the, the shortcut of, for paper. But the ideas are always uh, on the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so a little bit to follow what Danny was saying. Um, it was interesting. We were part of the Lumbung of publishers. So it was this reunion um, assembly that we self-organized with other 20 publishers from countries such as Indonesia, China, um, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Colombia, well, Chile, Uruguay, Slovenia, Latvia, so like many, many countries. And basically, we shared our strategies, tools, uh, methodologies too. And it was interesting because in the end, it didn't matter where you were from, but we all had this context that felt very um, pre precarious. And, but, and maybe we lived through different kinds of oppressions um, depending on the context, but in the end, we were always thinking of publishing as a way of resisting, a way of choosing our own words, of spreading them, archiving them, and 
And for us, like going to Documenta and it was the crazy thing is that we have to go sometimes to art book fairs in the States or in other countries or art fairs in Europe to actually find others who are also part of the global south. But in other ways, we would only um, talk to each other maybe through social media or emails. <laughs> so even though, um, of course, we would love to meet in our territories, um, we still sometimes lack of funding to actually do that. So maybe next time you can come to an art book fair in Chile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can keep talking. Okay, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. We're done. Uh, ah, we, we have questions? Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, somebody has a question. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, I guess my biggest question is, even when the process and the context gets so complicated, how do you afford everything? How do you then create, you know, where do you find the funding for all these things? Like, you obviously don't have to share, but just like the process of like, how do you fund these ideas when it's very hard to convince people to give you money? <laughs> You want to answer? I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> For example, us, we've never, or oh, I think only this year, we got a little bit of like state funding in Chile, but all of what we've done has always been um, self, uh, self finance. Yeah. And in the end, like maybe you can start only making 20 zines, for example, and then you pay those 20 zines maybe with what you could buy beer and <laughs> like you can just put like a few coins on the side and then try to create uh, an economy based on your zine. So maybe the next edition of that zine, you could make 50. And then in the next one, maybe you can make a hundred or maybe you can, I don't know, exchange an art object for free printing or take advantage of any free printing that you can find. It could be your school, I don't know, anywhere, basically. And for example, us, we go to print at a place uh, that used to be a DVD rental and that now has a few printers and it's very used by other people who make scenes and stickers because it's been the cheapest place to print in Santiago since like 2010. Yeah, and uh, well, for us, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, specifically myself, uh, I am a graphic designer, I'm a visual artist, um, I work, you know, uh, have another life from nine to five, and um, I have used a lot of that money, you know, advertising money and uh, graphic design money to fund our uh, project, to fund Terminal. Um, lately, um, and because we started when a few months before COVID started, so um, just lately we started to get like more money from selling books and uh, from a little bit of funding, like Camila said, you know, uh, Luckily, in Ecuador, we have many, like, not a lot, but a few grants and money from the government so that you can ask to travel and, you know, to print in this case. And so it's been like, you know, kind of complicated to navigate through that, but uh, we're able to do that. And, and the other thing I want to say, um, so uh, quick, is that... Um, Sometimes in, in our countries are you have to to place the the context the economies of that place of that country that context. So, uh, for example, I don't know the basic wage uh, monthly wage in Ecuador is four hundred dollars, and uh, you can you can make a living on that. You know, like not live like. Amazingly, but you can make a living on that. So uh, if you can handle to 
print and in a way, you know, to bring your books here. And I mean, it's like, you know, it's not crazy to be able to make a living out of it in a way, you know, but, um, but of course it's, uh, it's complicated. So what we do is we come here to New York, we try to sell everything that we can, mm -hmm. we stay in a friend's couch and then we go back as soon as possible to Ecuador, you know? Yeah. So that, that's, that's the whole point. <laughs> Camilo. Um, yeah, I think it, along the lines of what Jaime yeah. was saying, um, like the economies in, uh, for instance, in Colombia, the minimum wage is very low. So I think the, the fact is labor is also very cheap in, in our countries. And that makes it easier to produce when you're selling your books. Um, over here or in Europe. Uh, but also, I mean, I guess it's yeah. something similar in your countries, but yeah. um, like the price of a book in Colombia is like much cheaper than here yeah. in, at a retail price. So it's really difficult, to, at least in the Colombian market to make a living by distributing your work in you know bookshops or local fairs or whatever so i think yeah i wouldn't say it's something that is i mean i feel that we have to do other things other than than publish our books it's not like our only our only life project Th thank you so much for all of your thoughts. Um, I have a question, and I ask this as a artist book publisher, which is, what is why the commitment to print? Right? There are so many ways of distributing um, and dispersing content, so to speak. But the moment you have print, there are all of these problems of shipping and printing and costs associated with it. So I'm curious if you could elaborate on the commitment to print, but also the other ways in which you engage with publics in your uh, publishing practice. I just have a thought. I, I mean, I don't know if I've elaborated so much on this idea, but I think it goes along the lines of, you know, the same, we, we can make a parallel between attending a fair, you know, like something physical, you know, like the, we don't, we personally don't do like really high runs. And uh, there, there is a, a craft process in our, in our project, even though content can be conceptual, like there is a physical thing that, and that's why I was saying in the beginning, like there is a bit of everyone in our community that goes into our publications and uh, either because we outsource certain things and work with other workshops or or you know so um i think that physical element and that tactile part is 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 not just about the book being like a conveyor of ideas but like just being an element that connects people and can generate a physical experience. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with Camilo. And uh, in, in our case, especially and in my case, uh, I suppose also comes related with a huge attachment to the fetish condition of the book. And in our case, what we what mostly what we do are books. Uh, and this fetish condition is that uh, somehow the, the, the value and the meaningfulness of that object is more than their physical condition. No? And, and by believing uh, closely and blindly on this uh, idea that a, a, a book uh, has a language, it's a grammatic, it's a grammar, and there are arguments, ideas, uh, ways to build memory, to build complexity, that can only be elaborated through a book. Uh, yeah. 
more or less that, no? Uh, but also, uh, as uh, for example, one story that uh, somehow it's a good example of, of, of that you have to be super pragmatical to make this possible uh, is the story of this very publication. Uh, for, for many years, us were on we are in the book business and and trying to understand what the essence of what makes a set of uh, of sheet of papers a, a book and was a very simple conjunction of uh, characteristics and one is having a spine and if, if this thing has a spine can stay in a shelf and kind uh, fulfill this promise to survive over time because you know it's there no uh, but for example this publication was made in the middle of the pandemic and uh, as everyone here uh, we went through a moment of uh, of panic about uh, this is going to be over and uh, we won't have any more money to keep doing things and that's when we renounced to make things with the spine and we created this series which is like to go to the very very ba basic set of uh, how a publication can be which is a half leather thing stitch it and that's it no but um yeah more or less yeah okay <laughs> Uh, okay, that's it. Uh, and, <laughs> <bye>. <laughs> <laughs> muchas, muchas gracias. Okay, gracias.
Okay, we'll we'll figure it out. Yeah. And hope you. Um, I can do a stopwatchy thing. I think oh, we'll be okay. Slide? Yeah. So just. I think you just go oh, forward oh, back. Oh, forward, forward. Okay. Um, uh, could you remind me when, like, five minutes into it? Just in sure. case I. Sure. I'll I'll just try. And come back. Yeah. If you if I over. Yes. Okay. I'll do that. If I'm too long, I mean I. We're we're going. To... Yeah, like eight to ten. So if you, if you, you know. we'll, we'll know that we have to. I brought some too. Oh, you did? Yeah, oh, other ones. Good for you. I, I was going to bring some. <laughs> it's too much to slip it on. Show and um, Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Rit Premnath. I edit Shifter magazine. I'm really excited to be in conversation with. A uh, few colleagues, two of whom have tables at the Art Book Fair, and two of whom were founding editors of a very important publication, and I'm happy that we can hear more about meaning as well. Um, I'm going to be very brief to start things off. Um, I, the, the title of the panel is The Artist's Magazine, A Parallel Practice. Um, I'm particularly interested in the way Artists um, such as us have founded publications that create parallel communities, um, parallel discourses um, that are in relation to our art practices, but also occupy a slightly different space. Um, and it's also a space that often has a beginning and an end. We decide to found publications at a certain time, and sometimes we decide that we're done with them, that we retire them. And so um, I'm interested in the, the sort of uh, way in which this parallel project develops in um, our practices and um, the temporality of these projects, I guess, in relation to our practices. And um, with that, I'm going to um, hand it off to Ho, the Ho Tam. Um, each of the speakers will introduce themselves and speak for eight to 10 minutes. Um, and at the end, we'll have hopefully 10 to 15 minutes to open it up and have a conversation um, with all of you. So, hello. Oh. Uh, hello. Can everybody hear me? I... Yes. It's okay? Good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, my name is Ho Tam, and I'm an artist based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, thanks to Reed, who uh, invited me to this in con uh, conversation. Uh, because I find that I'm kind of among old and new friends. Uh, I met Rit when I was, I, I, I'm kind of do, do, have been doing different mediums. And when I met Rit, I was a video, I was making videos and doing some photography. And then years ago, before I met Rit, I met uh, Mira at uh, Skowkegan School and, uh, in Maine, and she was my uh, painting instructor. And she just reminded me how many years ago that was. <laughs> Maybe I'll let her tell you. I don't know if it's, a, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's really a long time ago. So, <laughs> and then uh, Tammy also uh, told me about uh, her, our ex encounter some, some years ago when she met, like when she found out about my magazine too, but I, whom I, I guess I, we never really had communicated. And, and by the way, Mira uh, sort of introduced me to my first, I guess, the artist uh, magazines, the me meaning. So, um, you know, thanks to that. Uh, basically, I was born in Hong Kong. And uh, as you see in the slide, that was my, um, I guess, my experience in uh, magazines. Like this is a typical kind of Hong Kong newsstands. And... Um, uh, the, like it was while Hong Kong was still a British colony and there was plenty of press freedom and the um, print medium was in the rising in the set, like this, that, that was the early seventies when I was a kid. And uh, I was, um, I guess I made my first magazine, I wouldn't call artist, but I make my first magazine when I was a kid, like about age 10, probably using found mag magazines and cutting out collages and maybe some writing. Uh, unfortunately, when we moved to Canada, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't have those uh, old magazines, like the one that I made before. Uh, but I remember that was, um, one of them was called Tomorrow's World. Um, and uh, 
And yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't even remember the content of them. It's just probably just kids writing uh, and a bunch of pretty pictures probably. Um, but so I sort of, um, when I found out about a magazine, uh, this publisher called Matt, Matt Cloud, I don't know if any of you heard of it. It's an online uh, print on demand magazine maker that you can kind of order from one to 100 copies. And I was very excited because I would be able to um, make magazines again and uh, in a relatively low cost uh, uh, situation. And um, so um, anyway, we could, oh, I, I will do this. Like this is the scenes in, I guess the magazines in Hong Kong is some of my, this is not exactly in the seventies, but it's sort of still have that kind of uh, idea I could give you. Um, so this magazine called, I, I founded this magazine called Whole Town about 2012. Maybe I'll just do it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we could stay there. Um, and uh, so far we have 15 issues. And this magazine is a uh, using the technology or the printing by MacCloud. Uh, which was giving me a lot of freedom because I they basically there's limit like there's only one kind of paper you can choose and one or two kinds of uh, binding that you can choose so so it's very limiting but at the same time it sort of um, formed that structure for me that I could kind of explore each project and I look at my magazine as a more like a cross between artist books and uh, artist magazine, like sort of an art magazine, a real magazine. Uh, and I play with different uh, approaches, different themes, different um, concepts. Uh, let me see what I have. Okay. So, um, so each issue is basically independent of, it's kind of an independent identity, uh, entity. Uh, so they could be um, from narrative to totally conceptual to writings to editorial. Uh, this is the first issue of uh, what you see is the first issue of my magazine is called, I, I decided because I'm naming the magazine my name, so I should uh, have an introduction of me in the first issue. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm, I, I was never the one who use myself so much in the work but i feel that like if i call myself I call this magazine my name i should it's fair game to kind of expose myself so 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 basically i exposed everything um you know not not in any uh sexual way but uh, but it's it's in in the history of me you know basically my my life is in this book uh, so each page is basically yeah you, you can press that and i'll do this okay I'm like <laughs> okay, good. That, yeah, I only have one image for each magazine. Uh, so each page is one year in my life. So you, what you see right now is like age zero, from zero to the end of my age, like that year. And then I was one, one years old. So, and then, um, uh, so each page has become like uh, the page number is also that uh, uh, my life that in that age. And uh, Yes. So, um, so I, I, I see that like one, once it, like uh, I actually end up also thinking it's also as a installation pro, uh, idea to kind of as a timeline. I match them with um, time uh, all the historic events that I kind of think it's important. And so you, what you see is uh, um, different events happened that year. Um, I'm, it's too small for me to read right now. If you can see it from afar, maybe. So uh, feel free to. Basically, the, it's it's a timeline. So it's it's from the year that I was born, uh, the date I was born, and then it goes to the end of that year, and then it begins again in the next year. Um, okay, and then um, in this magazine, the number six issue number six is called magazines. I sort of explore the idea of just playing the idea of magazines or what is a magazine. So each page is basically a cover of a magazine. So the entire book is uh, a magazine, like sort of with my own uh, images supplied by my sort of snapshots. 
And then I matched them with logos uh, of uh, brands, different brands of magazines. And they kind of have a relationship between them. Uh, trying, sometimes fun, mostly funny, I guess. It's, it's a humorous kind of issue. <laughs> and then uh, in this uh, issue is called Haircut 100, uh, number seven. And this is a uh, book about when I lived in New York City for a number of years, uh, from like 1996 to 2000. And I learned a lot, or, or I was very familiar with the Chinatown in the city and Manhattan. And uh, I decided to do an exploration of that. And so this is uh, a play with, on that photo magazine, like old, old time, like a light, light magazine or National, Ge National Geographic kind of concept with writings, matching with writings and also my own photograph. So I done this uh, research on the hair culture the, of the beauty salons in Chinatown. And uh, believe it or not, there, there were, I, I'm sure there's still about over a hundred of them in just that section of Manhattan. And uh, so all the addresses were from 2004. I guess I did this project in 2014. So this is um, that time and in documentation of that time. And then I do uh, exploration of each of the, this, like not the sectors, like there's the, sometimes the um, hair shop would be next, sorry, would be next to the, um, uh, like a synagogue. Or uh, there is, yeah, there's like upstairs, downstairs culture of this magazine. Sometimes they are kind of hidden and, you know, so I so explore all these like issues and uh, topics. Okay, so I guess I have two minutes left. So um, this is yeah, the Yellow Pages, which is a uh, old, like I make this in 1993, but this is a revision of that. So it's a play of uh, Asian stereotypes in the North American um scenario or, or our understanding of what is a who asian um and then there's an issue of hot male hot asian man uh because when i first uh create my own uh email address i use h-o-t-a-m my full name and people or even in this magazine people ask me what is hot H-O-T-A-M stand for, like, so, so their, their idea is a hot Asian man. So I, so this, this issue is about, so I just kind of play on that. And um, I invited artists and writers friends to contribute to this issue. So some of the names you may recognize of the artists in the project. Uh, yeah, so these are their portraits. I asked them to kind of supply. And the writings are, could be narrative, could be poet, poetry, could be, prose or different sources yeah. uh, and and they talk about their i guess their experience about masculinity or their understanding of masculinity or anything related to that um okay this is the last one i want to show you it's the greatest stories ever told it's uh uh one of the last issues of the whole time and uh it's make from bang notes, a collage of bang notes, and, uh, and then I write the stories. It's sort of like an adult's uh, children's book. And uh, sometimes the work kind of become an uh, installation again, like, like this is like a wall installation. And, uh, and then eventually I sort of get it translated, the book into 13 other languages. So they all come with, uh, it, it become another project. So I guess the life of this magazine uh, also become another series. And uh, so these are some of the collections. The whole time, the Posa is a photo-based magazine too. And then the greatest story ever told. So that's everything I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. You can actually control. Oh, I can control it. Yeah. That's asking too much. Which one is? <laughs> Uh, it's these two. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, it won't, I see. Uh, they're all out of order. Okay, so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to refer to the slides. I'm Mira Shore. Um, I'm a painter and a writer. And um, this is Susan B., who is a painter and a writer. <laughs> and and uh, I'm a painter and an editor. 
and an editor and a designer also. Designer. Um, so we're going to tag team because mm-hmm. it, in, in view of the nature of our collaboration, it would, I didn't feel that I, could, I should just speak or she should just speak. So, um, so I'll start by saying that our publication meaning, the genesis of it is in an essay that I'd started writing just completely on my own without any context or thought of publication called Appropriated Sexuality about the representation of women in the work of David Sally and the critical reception of that work. So we're, we're talking early 80s. And the, uh, the essay had kind of interesting history of rejections and uh, so reject, yeah, so in one case also of perhaps co-optation. And um, so we talked, we started to talk about how to get it out. We decided to do um, a magazine and I had absolutely no experience in publication. Susan had a lot. So, and we also were part of a critics group, but that is really where Susan comes in. Okay. So, yeah, Mira had this essay that she couldn't get published. And rather strangely, I thought we should just publish it. <laughs> and we, so we, this is actually the first issue of meaning. So it was an art magazine with no pictures. And um, in the first issue, I actually have a piece that people always quote from, which is everything that people said in my studio for years. And it's kind of a poster, you know, it's like all the bad things that people said to me, like paint bigger and use paint, more and paint <laughs> smaller, oh, you sorry. know, get a bigger space, you know, try to get your work together, whatever. So, um, so we sent out this flyer. This is all pre-computer, pre-email. We, we sent a flyer and strangely people subscribed to the magazine. So that actually, because we never knew we were gonna get beyond the first issue, which was in 1986. And we ended up going for 30 years. So this is like, you should watch out. <laughs> you should watch out what you start because you never know how long it's gonna go. But um, so there were all these things that, artists who write, and we are very interested in artists' opinion and to get away from the glossies and to get away from October and all these places that didn't take painting seriously at the time. So since we were both painters and we were involved, I'm involved with a lot of poets and critics and people who also couldn't get their work published, um, we started to publish it. And it was also during the AIDS crisis and we were part of a group where one of the main people had died, just died, like 1985, one of the first people to die from AIDS, and we published his writing, and he was only in his early 20s. So all those things, in other words, led to the first issue. And we, what, you want to go? Well, I think that the the thing that was amazing is that the minute we did it, we suddenly realized we discovered an audience, which we didn't know, and so that's when we decided, oh, Okay, well, I guess we have to do a second issue. Um, so we published twice a year for 10 years and, and stopped in 96. Um, in terms of the fact that we had no pictures, that was because we couldn't afford good paper, but it also meant that the, the people who bought it had to read it, and people who wrote for it had to actually base their views about artwork on descriptions of the artwork, so it kind of returned to the artwork. Um, so we came to an end in 96, but then we worked on an anthology, which was published by Duke University Press in 2000. And then in around 2002, we, we, we had other issues we wanted to address, and by now we were online, so we, did, we started Meaning Online, which came out like very sporadically. Sometimes two or three years would go by um, in between issues. And um, just to jump to the end and then go back to some of the content of it, as we were approaching our 30th anniversary, we were trying to figure out what to do online. The election of Trump um, sort of gave us a spur to really step on it right at that moment. And in a month, we put together an online issue. And that was our 30th, 30th anniversary, and that was the end. (laughs) <laughs> there is no, um, and, um, and I think that we ended just to get to the end of, of that is that what came in the way is life, basically, life, life and age and time. 
and how to, how we wanted to use our time, and then time maybe in another way. Um, so, I mean, we published over two hundred people, and now it seems a lot of it seems more historic to me because a lot of the people we published have died, um, and we had this format, which is uh, forums, which a lot of other places have picked up, where we'd send out a question. And, and I say send out, I mean in envelopes, you know, send it out. And we sent a question to like 150 people and maybe we'd get, if it was a question of racism, we got like 15 answers. If it was motherhood, which was one of the issues that's been reprinted a lot, um, we got quite a few interesting um, responses from people who said, how did you find out I had a kid? Yeah, that was, you know, like painters who did not want to be identified or artists that did not want to be identified as mothers. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, you know, all these th topics that may not seem that hot button now, but when we were pursuing them, they, they were hot button, um, topics. Well, the, the motherhood issue conti continues to be redone by, younger generations, like where they'll write us and say, we're working on this, you know, idea, and can we refer to you? Um, so one of the one of the things that was really important to me was the way in which doing meaning created a community. And I think many of us have the experience of going to art school, and then after about 10 years, you know, that community begins to evaporate, and it gets harder and harder to create community, but it's very vital to have what to feel that you have a community. So do, doing that, first of all, it created, we were friends, we knew each other, we met as children, but we were good friends by the time we did meaning. But for me, that was very important to have actually another person in my working life and, um, and then to then develop a community that I could rely on in some way. So I wasn't like completely alone in the world with my ideas, but nor were they, the readers, let's say, because then they were getting these brightly colored, everyone <laughs> different issues every six months. Um, so I think that that was, you know, one of the most, perhaps the thing I missed the most about, um, about that collaboration. I want to say one thing about, um, we, 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 we're absolutely clear when we started that we wanted to include male writers, male artists, yet we were a feminist journal. And when I, my teacher, Miriam Shapiro, after about a year that I'd been doing meaning said, oh, she was rejected. And so she started her own, you know, her own journal. And I thought, well, that was the essence of what I learned, you know, mm -hmm. in the feminist art program at CalArts, which was if the primary discourse, the, you know, does not, deal with you or accept you or rejects you, you create a space for your own discourse. And I, I feel that we did that. I, part of me wish, wishes I could still do it. And yet the discourse has moved on, you know, which I also acknowledge that now it's time. And for, also we were, um, we are coming out of something, you know, the feminist movement heresies, a lot of these um, collaborative groups that fought all the time. <laughs> of course, I'm a member yes, of AIR for 25 years, <laughs> so I really know about this question of feminist fightings. Mm -hmm. But um, we decided to make it more open-ended, so that's why we decided to, it was, you know, including men was the yeah, big, yeah, yeah. like men, oh but my at God. The same time, <laughs> but at the same time, it was a small cell publication so that we, I'm sorry that I haven't uh, advanced the, um, <laughs> the images, but, um, it meant that we could make decisions easily and quickly and, and not argue about every single thing that went on. And we really did agree as editors on a, a lot. Um, and um, I guess and the one more thing, I don't, oh, I don't that, know that what our time, yeah. timing is. I don't either. We're almost okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say that, you know, all, a lot of people that we published interviews with and now have become quite famous, like Carol H. Schneeman, Allison Knowles, nobody was interested in these people. We published um, criticism on Nancy Spiro, Kusama, the first piece, Florine Stedheimer. Uh, you know, all these people that, you know, we were kind of banking on the fact that nobody knew who they were, and you know, and now it's, they become so like well-known and I really feel, you know, I mean, I don't want to take responsibility, but um, we played we, our part in keeping certain things, uh, you know, in the foreground or at least bringing them into the ground of some kind. Um, and also we published things that 
like we published a wonderful piece by Nancy Spiro that she that had been rejected by Art Forum years before, and it's just a riot to read it. So, um, so the last thing I would want to say is that now everything that we've done, except for the anthology itself, is online. Um, so uh, the issues were all scanned, and they're available on Jacket too. Yeah, and all of that is available through links. Um, on our website, meaning online, and it's m slash e slash. Thank you. Thank you. Is it going to go back to you? You can hold, keep it. I'm it's hard. Go. It's okay. Oh, you're going to control. Yeah. Great. Um, oh, hi. Oh, sorry. I went the wrong direction. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Do you want no, I don't need it because oh, I'm right here. As, as with artist magazines, we uh, curate ourselves into things. So <laughs> um, staying on brand, I'm, um, I started Shifter in 2004. I should have edited this slide because it should say 2004 to 2021 because we just published our last issue, um, issue number 25. Um, Shifter began out of a kind of need for community, I would say. I had just finished um, my undergrad. I'd started graduate school and um, found myself back in India, where I'm from, um, from Bangalore, uh, without a visa to return to the US. And I felt kind of um, unmoored, um, and I wanted to create a space um, to continue to have um, conversations um, with people, a space that didn't feel um, national, nationally specific, racially specific, gender specific, but more thematic. Um, and um, so I started Shifter as a online free PDF in 2004. And, um, and over the years, um, Shifter has really taken on a variety of forms. Um, one of the, of course, constraints for that form is the amount of money in my bank account or who's willing to fund it. Um, but also, I think the um, me trying to figure out what is of interest and importance. And one of the things that I think became important to me early on um, as a kind of realization was that co-editing was an important aspect of Shifter. Um, the first 10 issues were edited uh, by me. I had a fictitious co-editor, uh, Gonar Heiliger von Lugen, um, <laughs> so I could reject friends and not <laughs> have them take it personally, but, uh, but fictitious co-editors don't do any work. So <laughs> um, I started working with real humans um, from issue 11 onwards, and it was a really fruitful process. Um, and some of the uh, collaborations were long collaborations with Matthew Metzger, who's a painter based in Chicago, um, and Avi Alpert, Avram Alpert, who um, I've been co-editing with, I shouldn't say been, because again, we ended, ended Shifter, it hasn't sunk in. Um, for the last several years. And um, the themes of Shifter have always responded to quandaries that we found ourselves in. Uh, in 2013, both Matt and I landed full-time faculty positions, and we found ourselves in this sort of weird situation where we were struggling to make uh, artwork alongside our uh, our. Uh, teaching and we were like, are we failures? You know, like what is, and we were back to that Bernard Shaw quip, which is uh, he who can does, he who cannot teaches. And we really wanted to examine that question first um, by thinking about teaching as a kind of doing, um, but also by thinking about how these intimacies between people who've had student teacher relations develop into relationships of artist peers over time. And so it's an issue of conversations between people who've shared those relations um, in the past. And the um, most recent issues um, that um, we've worked on, starting with the Dictionary of the Possible, which is this uh, little red book, <laughs> um, 
have uh, have been much more communal in their um, in, in the way they even begin. Uh, Avi always jokes that he just wanted to have a drinking group, but I forced him to make it a discussion group. <laughs> and uh, so we uh, started a series at the New School at Parsons, uh, where I teach. And every two weeks, we would hold um, a, a conversation on a key word that the people gathered in the group felt um, was important to talk about, was interesting, was something on their minds. And this um, structure of the discussion was very um, concrete, very fixed, two very short presentations, followed by an hour and a half of discussion, followed by going out to have a drink. So Avi could get what he wanted. Um, <laughs> but we, what happened was that we created what was a very um, dynamic um, and intimate community over the course of a year and a half. And the issue just sort of happened where uh, we'd, have, we'd be having a conversation and someone in the group would say, actually, avant-garde is a really weird word, uh, phrase, word, term to discuss. I think contemporary is a much more relevant phrase uh, or word, and that would become the next um, word to present and discuss. And so, um, and, and we started sharing a Google Doc to everyone who came, with everyone who came, and they would share um, questions and thoughts that came up from these discussions and the entries to the dictionary um, came out of this Google Doc. And, um, and I really loved the way in which this issue produced a community of both contributors and readers um, in advance of its publication. And, um, and so Avi and I felt like this is how we wanna work. We wanna um, do like this kind of year and a half of programming and then something very condensed comes out of it. And so learning and unlearning was another such um, um, project, one that began actually with a question of the kinds of publics who come to Shifter events and whether we want to broaden that's the scope of those publics. So the first event of learning and unlearning was hosted by someone I knew very well who happened to be the guard at the building where I teach at Parsons and I invited um, Musakar Butt to lead a listening session of the Islamic call to prayer that he listened to every morning when I would see him at, at 10 a.m. And so I asked if he could um, lead that. And it was, a, it was interesting, it was odd, it was uncomfortable. It wasn't the kind of thing we were used to doing, but I think um, it was, for that reason, really generative. Um, and we uh, have also, over the years, been hosted by people, and so Learning and Unlearning was hosted by Art in General, which sadly does not exist anymore. Um, and these sorts of uh, collaborations uh, allowed for a kind of scale shift and shifter, and so shifter is now was, <laughs> not is, um, a print publication, and, um, and all of those sort of constraints of print publication, which is the cost of printing, um, the cost of shipping, all of that um, may, starts to make sense when um, someone else is paying for it, of course. Um, and then I'll end with waiting um, the last um, issue of Shifter. I was, and, and to connect it to my own art practice, I'm an um, installation artist, I guess. I had always thought of my studio practice teaching and shifter as three very separate things that I did in parallel to each other. Um, and I was invited to do two exhibitions uh, uh, right before the pandemic at the list uh, at MIT and Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati. And they asked if I would like to do a publication with the shows and I proposed an issue of shifter rather than um, a monograph. And um, it, of course we had a pandemic. Um, uh, I have to say that we picked the theme waiting prior to the pandemic. Um, and of course it became uh, relevant in ways that we hadn't anticipated. Um, and, and one of the things that's really important to me and I'm sure I'll continue to kind of um, do in my practice, whether or not 
we continue shifter is that I'm, I'm interested in other people's practices. I'm interested in other artists. I'm interested in other writers. And when I'm given an opportunity to um, show, which is to make my work public, I want to bring that community with me, which is a community, an intellectual community that inspires me, that is, I think, a part of what I do, whether or not all of them know who I am. Um, and so this uh, series of uh, online events led to um, this final publication of Shifter, Waiting, um, and of course, the exhibitions that were parallel to it. And I'll just end by saying, which is the question of like, what, when do you decide to end a publication? And um, publication making is a lot of work. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's a very particular kind of work. It's a kind of communal labor. It's very like outward facing. And I think I've just become more selfish maybe. And I wanna spend more time in my studio um, and uh, also spend more time writing. Um, and so um, part of the reason for bringing Shifter to a close is, as I've been saying to people, even though I haven't acted upon it, um, to spend my 40s building a body of writing. So I will let you know if that worked out in eight to 10 years. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Tammy Wynn, and I am an artist and the publisher of Passenger Pigeon Press. Um, at Passenger Pigeon Press, we do a few different things, but the main thing that we do is a publication called Martha's Quarterly. This was um, a press that I started in 2016 when, you know, I think my studio work, I work in painting and more involved sort of uh, unique artist books and also works on paper. And in 2016, before the election, um, the work had taken a very political turn in that I was starting to appropriate um, old uh, sort of policy documents that I would find, um, military documents, things I would find in various archives. And I felt that um, the sort of gallery um, did not offer the kind of democratic and sort of distributive qualities that I had really wanted the work um, to possess. And so I decided to start a press with the goals of being able to produce um, works of art that could travel and, 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 and be in many places at the same time. And so that was sort of the inception of Passenger Pigeon Press. Right. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is um, a variety of Martha's Quarterlies. We've got 25 now, so this isn't all of them. This is an image of all of them closed. And I think one of the essential questions that I'm always asking when I'm making a, a Martha's Quarterly is, how do you read? You know, what is the process of reading? How do you engage audiences that you don't see and don't really know into experiences of reading content that they might not be interested in? How do you engage Engage folks with processes of reading about subjects that are about different places that they'd never heard of, um, incorporating perspectives that are less popular. How do you engage um, in that kind of an experience in a fun and exciting and modest way? So this is an example of all of uh, these Martha's Quarterlies opened. So you can see that they open in a very sort of vast variety of playful ways. There's toys too, there's stickers, there's scratchers, there's cutouts, there's all different kinds of playful mechanisms that engage the hope to engage folks in the process of reading um, subjects that I believe are content and um, that are urgent and worth sort of putting in the forefront. Each season, 200 of them are made by hand, and I um, invite people from all different subjects. So I've worked with, you know, policymakers, definitely artists, 
athletes. That was a really interesting one. Um, scientists. Um, and I invite them to, um, you know, give me what they do, you know, whatever it is that they do. Um, let me play with it and let me kind of connect it to something else that I think it's connected to. And so each of these artist books also is accompanied by an, by an essay that I write each season of the year that tries to thread these different, um, these different sort of um, explorations. So this was the first Martha's Quarterly, and it featured an old document um, that I found that was written in 1895 by a man named Chief Pokagon. Chief Pokagon was a poet and an activist and a journalist, and he described his life living with the passenger pigeon when it was fully alive and thriving. And he talked about living with this bird and how his community simultaneously supported their breeding and also used them for, for meat and also game. And I was really um, struck by the nuance of this description, that there was death, there was life, there was all of these things that were happening at once. It didn't exactly have a sort of zero-sum quality to it, which is what led the passenger pigeon to its um, demise. Um, many white settlers started to kill the bird in such large amounts that the species couldn't keep up with that. Um, to the right side of this slide is Martha, which is what this quarterly takes its name after. Martha was the last passenger pigeon who died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1917. And now that is her housed at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. So this is how the first book opened. And so you can see that um, it opens up in a sort of concertina and then you've got to fold things and unfold things to be able to read Chief Pogagon's essay. And I think, you know, I kind of think about Martha's Quarterly as being a kind of a resurrection of the passenger pigeon, but in the form of publishing. So I, I've never really done this before, but I really wanted to sort of to share with all of you um, Martha's Quarterly as it relates to my greater studio practice. And to me, I really think of Martha's Quarterly as being a tempo, that there is a beat every season and that there's all this other stuff that's happening at the same time. So here's my painting studio. There it is right there, working on a, a bunch of stuff. Um, and here's an example of some of my more unique artist books that, you know, there's there's more tricks. There's they're made out of leather. You know, there's let handset type and things like that. Um, Martha's Quarterly sometimes uses handset type, but not in this kind of a way. Um, this was an exhibition called Four Ways Through a Cave, which um, explored, uh, you know, ways in which one could pass through this particular cave that was important in the Vietnam War and uniting the North and South um, communist um, supporters. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk, keep talking about Martha's Quarterly, but then I'm gonna just show you images of four ways through a cave. And so just to sort of give you an idea of the different scales um, in which I'm thinking about publishing and thinking about storytelling. So this is Martha's Quarterly, um, I forget, what is this? This is issue nine from 2018. And this was an issue that was exploring Chinese nationality through the cotton industry in Tanzania, which is mostly um, run and owned by Chinese nationals. Um, and then it also juxtaposed this narrative with um, um, May Lum's work, and May Lum is a storekeeper in New York's Chinatown, and she has um, an archive of family history that is unique and special to her family's shop, and much of May's um, activist work is about um, fighting gentrification that is happening in New York's Chinatown. So this issue aims to put into question what is Chinese nationality. This is another issue. Um, this is um, 12 BPM from 2020. And this was an issue that explored issues of air quality with regards to architecture, 
nail salons and snake plants. And what was really exciting about this was I invited Tess Elliott, who's a, mostly a VR artist, um, to contribute to this zine using something that she already does. And so in order to activate parts of the zine, you um, you wave your phone over this picture of a nail bottle, um, nail polish bottle, and this giant snake plant pops out in your um, in your phone, which is pretty, I, I thought that was pretty awesome. <laughs> Uh, this is Stone Path, and this was another issue that explored man-made irrig irrigation systems um, as it relates to how eels travel in Micronesia and also the Aral Sea. And this is another issue that was more recently made. And this one, you know, I made this one um, sort of as a response to the war in Ukraine. And I was thinking a lot about how war is simultaneously always an abstraction and also a series of personal experiences. Um, and I invited um, Heidi Howard, who is a painter, and Charlie Sumaya Varek to contribute to this issue. Charlie is a poet based in Manila and Heidi is an amazing painter based here. And um, I sort of wanted to see their work together to explore this issue. And it was also paired with this, this other military document that I had found in an archive. Here's some examples of some recent paintings. These were the Stations of the Cross that I recently made. They were at the 12th Berlin Biennial. It was a series of paintings that I did exploring um, Pulau Galang, which is where my parents were uh, Vietnamese boat refugees. And it was exploring sort of the legacy of colonialism, Christian expansion in Vietnam, and you know ideas about refuge and liberty. So this is Martha's Quarterly, issue 17. There are no edges of the moon. This was really exciting because I got to work with Altenay who um, is working on um, uh, the moon project, the Armidus. And, uh, you know, she was telling me a lot about all of the different sort of ways in which they were observing the moon in order to create, you know, a sustainable life on the moon. And so I decided this was also during the pandemic to do an issue that was only about observation. How do you observe the world around you? How do you observe something as mighty and grand and sublime as the moon, and how do you make it into something tangible um, and relatable? This was in 2018, Smiley the Cannibal. This explored capitalism and cannibalism through cryptocurrency, which was really fun to learn about. I worked with a data analyst named Taiwo Token and also um, an English teacher, Jacob Hughes, who does a lot of work on um, thinking about cannibalism and how it could be used as a dynamic metaphor for capitalism. This is kind of recent. This is working with the Thai artist, Nawin Nutong, um, Make Me a World. Nawin is, um, he works a lot in video gaming and um, he had sort of designed this website that aims to use Civilization um, Five and sort of rethinking the video game so that the entire world of that virtual reality extended from, um, the former kingdom of Thailand. And then what I did was I was really interested in this idea of world building and I juxtapose his work with this um, document that came under the Hoover administration. Um, they were really worried in the 20s about you know, whether or not consumers would lose uh, their desire to consume. And this, uh, this document proved that that was not true. Um, and it was sort of a comparison between, you know, these two ways of thinking about building life. And then the last one I'm going to share is this one. This is called In the Garden. And I had the pleasure of working with the anthropologist James Biello, who does a lot of work about Bible studies and about ways in which um, human communities um, 
create um, physical manifestations of the Bible. So thinking about Bible theme parks and different um, objects that express faith. Um, and then it's juxtaposed with um, the work by a um, young Filipino photographer who works in Manila, Gio Penalillo, who um, recently produced this amazing picture of the Feast of the Black Nazarene, which is a festival that occurs every January in Manila. And his photograph um, is a very sort of dense picture of many different expressions of people in a swarm at this feast. So I'm juxtaposing um, those two different thoughts. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. <laughs> um, since these events are fast and furious, I'm actually going to just open it up to the audience for questions or comments. And please use the microphone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing those projects. They're so inspiring. Um, I'm curious about the printing process. You know, especially, re your books are just amazingly printed, and I'm wondering how you mastered that whole process of, you know, finding printers and picking your size and picking the materials. And if you, I just, if you could talk about that a little bit, that'd be great. Sure. Um I'd be happy to. The um, well, I'll I'll be pretty brief, which is that the printing process is also so uh, dependent on print runs and budgets. So the um, first, when I switched from PDF to a print publication, I was doing print on demand, which is sort of like how Ho prints um, um, Ho Tam, and and so then there you can print shorter runs, but each print is more expensive than an offset print. Um, but depending on my budget, I've worked with printers everywhere. The most recent issue is printed in Lithuania. Uh, Dictionary of the Possible, the little red book was printed in China. But uh, there are sometimes these sort of strange things. So like uh, the printer in China, like the quality is really good, but um, you have like their minimum run is a thousand which is a lot of shifters. So I have several boxes um, in my storage unit. If anyone would like to buy them, please. So, and, and so I'll pass it along. Yeah, it's a, it's a quandary for sure. Oh, sure, anyone who wants. One of the reasons we shifted, using the word shifting, uh, shifted from um, print, I mean, we because we did print all of our issues for the first 10 years, but then, <laughs> It became, and when we came out with the book, we realized, oh, we could go online. And I, I mean, that's what I love about your publication, um, Two Coats of Paint, is that it just comes in my email, you know. I don't have to go to the store and look for it. And um, we really enjoyed doing, being able to use photos and color because we couldn't afford it before. So this was like a big breakthrough for us that we, um, that we let people use photos and, you know, artists um, use their paintings. And this was, I think it really changed the whole nature of the magazine, even though it was online. Although I have to admit that in the end, I prefer, I mean, I love the fact that what's online is online for the mm -hmm. moment. But, um, but on the other hand, there's something, you know, I, t the tactility, the objectness uh, of a printed uh magazine i i kind of still miss or i miss well as we were as we shifted to um to online i still missed publication and there's nothing more fun than to come into somebody's house and see the spines you know and see oh, oh my, somebody saved this and it's, it's you know it's cool and you're doing these amazing works well, really the printing is Pretty chaotic. Um, I at the beginning when I was first starting Passage or Pigeon Press, I, there's this uh, really inexpensive uh, photocopy place in Jersey. I think it's called like Best Value Copy or something. It's really inexpensive, and they would also ship overnight. And what I would do is I would make a mock-up of like a passenger of a, a Martha's Quarterly, send it off there, and then I would just you know 
put it in a suitcase and go down to the center for book arts and cut all of the um, cut everything up on the guillotine. And then to sort of lux it up a bit, I would print like something on the letterpress printer and then sort of do all of that there. Um, now um, I'm I'm very lucky to, and, and happy to be a professor at Wesleyan. So I do everything there and um, we've got um, we've got some equipment, but it's done in a similar way, but without the sort of you know, uh, printing it online and then having it sent back. Uh, in my in my case, uh, is that okay? Oh, okay. Uh, in my case, I um, I sort of forego all the um, like quotes uh, or uh, research on the materials, and I go to just the print on demand uh, print like online printer, so that they will provide the end product to me, and then I could focus on the content. Uh, which I really think like magazine is about is about the content. So I, I'm kind of putting that in the priority and then the, uh, I guess the uh, technical part on the kind of other supplementary uh, side. Uh, but I guess the um, advantage of that is also becoming disadvantage. It's like it's because the product is neither like slick as a real magazine or hand work as a risographed printed book or or sort of format like low rest like is a people like that kind of technology and the mind is kind of in sitting in between and it's not really like a desired <laughs> product so it sort of didn't i never really sell that well <laughs> and uh, so so after 15 copies I, I mean 15 issues i decided that uh, maybe that's time and i have also exhausted that like uh, energy in putting the content into the book because I have exhausted that kind of type of printing. So I, in the next project, I would probably go through another printer instead of uh, the same Mac Cloud. Okay. Um, thank you so much. We're out of time, but thanks so much for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Bueno, buena suerte, salud. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola. Salud. Buenas tardes. Hola. Hello, thanks a lot for being here. I'm Santiago Escobar Jaramillo from Colombia. I'm the publisher of Raya Editorial. And we have Luis Covello from Venezuela and La Chancleta Voladora. And Pajit Aride. Aride. Eh, Meret. Meret from Venezuela as well, graphic designer who will be joining us to tell about Diana Lopez's new book. Um, I wanted to have this opportunity also to thank um, David. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for uh, Printed Matters New York for inviting us. It is, has been such a journey. It has been such an experience to see so many people interested in photo books and art books. And Raya Editorial, it is focused mainly in this kind of work where photography is the principal or the main medium to express and to narrate the different stories. Why I began as a publisher? Because this was my first photo book, the one that is projected. Uh, Patria Muerte um, talks about Venezuela and Cuba and how these revolutions are always in pain and in difficulty and how they too uh, seems together. Uh, the other book is Colombia Tierra de Luz. It is a project that I've been I developed for 10 years and it talks about the victims of violence in Colombia and are symbolic reparations or acts of support where a light a, appears as the way not only to show the space but also the light that gives comfort to us and brings the spirit and because of these books because i was editing and publishing these books i decided that i wanted to open a new publisher because we didn't have enough photo book publishers in Colombia. And to me, this is, I want to read this in Spanish. La magia de la tinta ocurre si los poros del papel encuentra un poco de aire, otro de polvo, una pizca de paciencia al tiempo. And that last line talks about how you have to be patient with time and how you have to believe in paper and, the, and ink to dry and to tell the story. You as an editor, you as an author, for sure you want to convey a message, you want to tell something, but it depends on the uh, reader in the audience to complete the message. To me, the food books that we are editing and publishing depends on how you relate how you ask questions rather than give answers. I think it's, it's, it's more interesting, if you like, to, to push the reader to complete the story. You know, because of course, this, this collection is called ANZ, Fotografía Expandida de Latinoamérica. Latin American expanded photography. And it is not only about the documentary photography that we are more used to, if you like, but it's about other kind of photography that thinks about Antotipia, thinks about 
different technologies of yeah, technical aspects, but how you can reflect on landscape, a, a standing on technology as a, as a friend or as a resource. Um, this is Fabiola Cedillo, uh, she's from Ecuador, and her work is about mining, but how mining is always in tension with nature, with society, and what Fabiola does is to like to intervene the images and to make different mem membranes. La Niña no obedece, Ana Maria Lagos, uh, she's uh, asking the audience again about the role of women in society and why women has to behave in a, in a way that she didn't accept. So she do this performatic acts and be as she wants as a wolf if you like if you like and the photo book is always telling you like different aspects of society somehow i i prefer to work with authors that are in the in the middle like in the border the things that are not really we are used to that are not political correct. Musuk Nolte from Peru is about uh, the marches and um, the street fighting of people in the street against the government. So he makes a comparison between the Congress that is completely quiet, he's taking one minute of silence, and then outside there is the crowd uh, yelling and uh, asking for their own rights. Servicio Militar Obligatorio, Agustin Zuluaga. It talks about how the people, the people in Colombia, they have, to, they must go to the army. They, it is an obligation. And somehow he put this in, in, in contrast to say why we, why we have to fight a war that we don't want so um, he uses like negatives to he uses negatives that he that his good friend his best friend did in the in the army and in the other side he has other narratives of what was happening outside the army so as you see all these photo books are participatory I like when you can uh, touch them, move them, compose them, complete them, if you like. And, and to me, it's very about the manual aspect of it, about the ritual, about thinking the, the book as, a, as an organism that has a skin. And that why, that's why the skins of the books that I'm doing are always uh, putting uh, some tension on it. This is uh, Warawarwawa, River Cloud. Uh, it talks about the little prince or Principito, but it's written in Aymara. And to, to him, it was very important that the, the photo book was made in Bolivia with Bolivian um, children. And we use his very first drawings to include it as part of the traditional one, but always showing a different aspect of it. And it's very beautiful in the sense that he's recreating, constructing these different worlds, these different characters. Um, Diario of David Fajad are some, it's a diary that is happening in the, in, in, in the, in the different rivers of Colombia and it combines writing, drawing, maps, um, illustration, and yeah, some, some, sometimes I, I prefer to combine photography with other means because, for example, I'm an architect. My studies are in architecture and I always have 
my pen or a or or, or a notebook to to make drawings and why not include that in your process you know because sometimes we are asked that photography should be one way but to me is how you can uh, invert that how can you transform that uh, verde this is this is the third edition that we have been printing of this photo book is about the last 10 years of the revolutionary armed groups of Colombia FARC before and while they were signing the peace uh, agreement and yet for example this book no a, a publisher in Colombia wanted to publish it because it was like a taboo why how can you uh, print photograph first how can you print a photo book that is talking about the revolutionary groups they are war machines but you see and they are not they are people as well it doesn't matter if you are on this side or on, of the other side or in the pol in the political term but let's talk about the humanities talking about women men love friendship of course war violence but it's also future you know like this is what the peace agreement brought to colombia and yeah the book has a map that's why i was telling you that for me the the skin of the books are very important and this is like a map of colombia yes but it's also the territory these are the mountains as you can see them a very scrap uh, and here you have also a texture this is not a tape a coffee table book it is a a book about this revolution and about how uh, there are different aspects of life that must be told. Uh, yes, and it's a very interesting project th that is very broad, like white. But what we wanted to do was to tell the story from the jungle to the city in the sense that you come from war to peace and there is a transition, there is a journey. So the work is always talking to us about this. Morning Song, Sara Paps from Argentina, is, it talks about the loss. Uh, for example, um, her baby that was in her belly died during the pandemic. And it talks about the grief, the the pain, the how she, with her family, crossed this. Now she she got she, she got pregnant again and have a new baby. But we were doing this as a process as, uh, of catharsis for her. It was important to to show and and understand photo books and photography as a medium to to express better if you like to, to to show other aspects of life and yeah to me as an editor i'm always interested to try to look a little bit far away from the problem you know because the, the authors are always into it they're immersed and how we as a viewer or as an editor or as a reader can understand their problem and so i think my my role here is to to look for a conversation to look for a dialogue between authors designers editor and try to to bring the best book as possible but when i say as best as possible it means that it represents the universe of the project Somehow, every book, as you can see, is different in the sense that yeah. Gabriela Baez, la gente deprimida tiene sexo sucio y ganas de morir. It talks about depression, but talks about drugs, of, um, about sex. And she uses, you know, photography and painting and su. <laughs> it textiles to to do to produce her work and this was also a catharsis project and yeah she's a 
She's a, a young artist, but she's really doing amazing work from Puerto Rico. Um, the object was trying to to show like, look at the print, no, um, like a accordion, hold huh? out accordion, but at the same time you you can see that this is like a body, like somehow she that's how she wanted to express herself and. To me, it's important to to have different uh, details. In this case, the stripe is different for each of the books, so you don't have the same book each time. This is my own, own book. It is just published recently about an intervention to Doris Salcedo's crack in the Turmin Hall because of the use of the if, uh, small or scale figures. This crack became a, an abysm. As you can see the comparison, the first image and the second one, somehow there is a moment where you don't understand what's happening, but to me that border or that frontier is the one that divides us. And so I, I always try to do my political projects, has this political weight and ask. And this is the, the, the photo book of Oscar Castillo, he was, he he says sorry for not being able to to come on time, but this is our last photo book that we just printed uh, one month ago. And to us, it is important because it talks about the how the prisoners in Venezuela they pass from being in this very conflictive, contained with fears, with a lot of difficulties, how they make a journey for freedom. You, why, how? They form a hip hop band and somehow it is about their redemption. And that's why this, this for example, this booklet is out of the box, it is free. So Oscar is using documentary photography to express himself. Uh, he lived there many times, facing the, the dangers and difficulties of live in a, in a contained space like this and very dark, very difficult. But also he has been helping them to, to dream and the, and the photo book talks about it. You see, the, the book is is a mean to to show that there are other ways, you know, not to stay there uh, in in conflict or in confusion, but the way he, they can go for redemption. We are very happy with this photo book because this has been nominated. It is shortlisted for Paris Photo and. It is for us a way to show in other places like the United States or Europe that there are a lot of things happening in Latin America and we don't ha we shouldn't be named that we are doing Latin American photography but a, a diversity of different types of photographs. That's why I wanted to to put this different selection of photo books that we are doing. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, my good friend uh, Luis Cobello after I present this book. This is Madre Esterra. <laughs> this is Madre Esterra. This is also about the false positives. False positives is a, is a term that uh, they use in Colombia to tell the military that they were doing great by killing uh, guerrillas but they were not killing guerrillas, but innocent people. So the false positives is uh, how they pretend that they won the war, but they were showing other kind of dead people, like innocent ones. So the mothers who are this, uh, of course, are mourning their sons. And the project, the book, you have to tear it you have to break it to uh, uh, check and to see what is inside. What is inside are the photos or their families, their 
songs. So this project is about memory, but also about symbolic acts of intervention. Uh, and now, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm giving the word to Luis Covello. He's from, um, from, from Venezuela and he has La Chancleta Voladora. And we also published a new, the second edition of um, Surumbatico, that is a, a book that you should uh, know firsthand. And yeah, welcome. Muy bien, very good, Santiago. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us here. Um, I represent La Chancleta Voladora, which is the flying flip flop. Uh, it's a sarcastic way. Uh, everyone knows who uh, grow up in Venezuela or Latin America that the power of the chancleta never <laughs> has to be <laughs> underestimated, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's a lot of stories about that, but I, it's, it's, a, it's a joke also, uh, and I wanted to um, use it to bring especially uh, Latin American photographers. Uh, I am a photographer, I'm a art, I'm a, uh, I am an artist, but uh, I, I wanted to cr I create this collective to invite another authors to be, um, I live in San Francisco and I was like a, for the last two years seeing like a we, not we, but it needs to, to show to people in, especially in the United States, more works about uh, Latin American photographers, not just photo with uh, books with photos, more like a photo libros with stories, not like a, because the difference in English and in Spanish is quite a little bit different because photo books is okay, a photo book, but photo libros for us means more like a, with a story. If you say un libro de fotos, is un libro de fotos, photo libro, is a story, and um, and as you uh, saw here, we have a lot of authors doing amazing things, and uh, I just I'm, I'm here just presenting a few, uh, and I wanted to show a little bit uh, where okay, I had to. So this is un poquito la chancleta voladora. Uh, I invite uh, an editorial from uh, Argentina called Chaco, and I, I, I won't stop in every project, but uh, it's like a, also the same, um, like a, the same thing with um, Santiago was saying, like a touching the skin uh, and things like that. Uh, this is a, a project about uh, dictadura in Argentina. Um, Reconstrucción also. Uh, so now first is Jose Luis Cuevas from Mexico, which is also in the border, in the, on the edge, work, working so much. Okay, this is one of the, I will present in a few, is Diana Lopez. And Faride, he's here uh, to talk more because Diana is supposed to be here, but she didn't make it because she's stuck a little bit in Venezuela right now. So um, Faride will tell more about this project, which is amazing. And we have some copies, just two, one, that, and another one, just that. Um, this is El Baul, which is uh, his husband, no, no, Herman. Uh, which is a, um, a project that like, uh, he did in the, his uh, baul, how do you say baul box? Uh, yeah, something like exactly. Okay. Yeah, and with his family, he uh, saw that uh, his father's uh, parents were like a traveling around the world and they have like an amazing life. But Arhman is not a photographer at all, right? It's like a more... Mm, it's a very good, I mean, I think it's an artist. Yeah, definitely. We agree with that. Frias is Ana Maria Ferris, is a, a Venezuelan, also a Venezuelan author. Uh, he was through, going through um, a previous book, which was like a more uh, painful, and she decided to do something more happy for the next, for her next book. 
and uh, also it's a design for um, what is what is the name of the uh, the designer Ricardo Baez. Ricardo, exactly, Ricardo Baez, which is um, he designed and make like a she decides to do something more uh, I don't know it's more lighter but that is not so much but anyway <laughs> This is Usier. This is a book of uh, Juan Toro, which is also um, very, um, I mean, uh, normal book for the work that he used to do because he is very focused on other things about violence in Venezuela, which I like more. But this is uh, something about um, the uh, fabric that closed, and he was like uh, creating this uh, memory about uh, this this place. And the, and the laborers, trabajadores, workers. Uh, this is the this is one of the photo books that I really love um, a lot. It's Eros del Brillo. It's Federico Stoll from Uruguay. He went to La Paz, Bolivia, and um, he stopped and started to know the shine shoes, the Olympia water shine shoes. Sure, shine. sure shiners, sure. especially in La Paz, in Bolivia, there is something very especially they use like a, this pasamontañas, this cover because the, it's very high, the La Paz, and the sun is very heavy. It's like a chill sometimes, and also they they are like a uh, mar, uh, criticize, huh? yeah, Marginalized. ah. Club. Uh, exactly, Balak Club. Uh, they are like uh, they used to be marginalized of, on the society, and they cover their faces to not be like uh, shown. And he creates this amazing book, like uh, heroes, all the shine, shine heroes. And he made. I have copies in my table. I didn't bring everything here because everyone was like uh, wanting to buy it, <laughs> that especially. And and this is. Uh, something like a comic uh, photos and but also uh, a collective help to the to the shine he decided to to give like a um, two thousands or three thousand copies to them to sell it on the streets it's like a collab and i mean it's amazing it's a really federico really made it with this very much very good well but i uh, so I present this. Uh, I present these authors like I really like it because La Chancleta Voladora. I mean, I decide who is in the table because these are projects that I really like it, or a person who I really believe in photography in ways, in different ways, the, like as the stories or not like a conventional because it's like a exactly like a. Um, reading a book, creating a story with pictures. Sounds like a cliche, but it's like that, exactly. It's like an entering in different dimensions that people create, and then we are that. Santiago is one of the most enthusiastic because he's doing other authors. So, I mean, it's a start. And this is like a just how many years? During the three. three. Oh, come on. It's amazing how is the future is showing, no? Because Everyone wants to publish with him. <laughs> and I know that uh, it's, uh, it's a very good thing. And then we decided to be to do this together to, for this fair. So, and then also I wanted to introduce briefly because if I will do it with my work, I will need like a three hours for each project. So I am a photographer too, an artist, and I wanted to introduce very briefly my photos. This is the second edition of Surumbatico that I published with the uh, call co-published with La Raya Editorial, which is uh, um, inspired in 100 years of solitude. I went to Aracataca, where Gabriel Garcia Marquez born, and I created this whole crazy thing. The first edition was it's all out, and I, we decided to do it together. And the next week, actually, I, the next week, uh, uh, I will exhibit this uh, ex exhibition. I, I made it in around the world, like a, a, around now, like a 15 exhibition, but I will do it in the Festival Gabo in Bogota in next Friday, which is for me very, it's an amazing thing. So 
this is surumbatico. Then this is after I made Chas Chas, which is uh, uh, inspired by a, a comic that I read when I when I was um, 17 years old in Caracas. I, I was a collect collect collector, collector of comics and a comic about a neighborhood came to me. And then I, after 32 years, I went to the to the neighborhood to create a fantasy and inspired by Borges and Spinetta and Cerati and all the authors from Argentina and Buenos Aires that I really love. And I found something about my family because I, I didn't know that my grandfather uh, um, born in Buenos Aires. And this is one of the characters very important is Pilar, is my sister, is the sister I never had. And uh, because in Parque Chas, everything that you lost in, in life exists in Parque Chas. So I went to Parque Chas to know my sister. You need to know more if you <laughs> see the book. <laughs> okay, this is Chachas, and then this is my latest project, which is Te Amo. It's a reflection about the uh, dysfunctionality of love, inspired again for another right thing. Uh, fotonovela mexicana, and where is full, plenty of machismo and misogyny and horrible things, and it's like a revisiting, revisiting so many things about that myself, and also to see how it was. Oh my God, I did this. Oh no, they they do. I mean, so uh, this project is um, uh, ten books. I am about to finish the last one, which will be print and papel revolución, the same paper, which is used for the tortillas to wrap the tortillas and the tacos in Mexico City. What will be print in that paper, <laughs> that thing. And okay, so I think um, it's the moment to introduce uh, to Faride. And she will talk about Diana Lopez. Diana Lopez is uh, an artist uh, from Venezuela. Uh, she makes this an amazing book. And uh, sorry that she's not here. She didn't come. But uh, well, Faride, Faride lives, actually lives in New York. And we are very lucky that we were very lucky to have her here to talk about Diana and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So since I'm speaking in behalf of Diana, I will try to be as neutral as possible since I want to cause a good impression and represent her as best as I can. Um, uh, I'm a book designer, a researcher, an educator, and a visiting scholar at Columbia University. And I had the pleasure and the honor of designing Diana's most recent book. Um, since I want to make this as organized as possible, I'm going to read a little bit of the text that was written by Alejandro Castro uh, for the presentation made at Center for Book Arts here in New York in 2021. Diana's Eye by Alejandro Castro. Recently, the artist, cultural manager Diana Lopez printed in the workshops of Ex Libris in Caracas a book she titled El Ojo de, the eye of. In this digitization and recovery of a collaboration she made between 1995 and 1996 with children, Franklin Osorio, Wen Yukai, Lucy Po, and Gala del Monte, to whom she gave a camera with black and white film. The instructions were simple. Take a picture of the beautiful or the ugly, the small or the big. Part of this work was, part of this work was presented in the exhibition, This Is Not a Hammer, at Sala Mendoza in 1997, and in the International Studio Program at MoMA PS1 during the artist residency in a program sponsored by the Galara Foundation in 1996. It is a book of photos not taken by Diana Lopez, instead by children. And the eye of 
is not the full title because the book has to be open to be able to complete the sentence. We will understand later on that it is about the vision of each of the children. It is not one book, but four books, four worlds. Lopez is not the author, but the one who enables us to look at the world through their eyes. Y aquí me tomo yo un poco la libertad de parafrasear parte del texto de Alejandro Castro en español. <clears throat> Gala fotografía las cosas para poseerlas. Fotografía a su padre dos veces. Le gustan los animales, las esquinas y los paisajes. When you, la profeta, estudia la distinción entre realidad y ficción. Toma fotos de aviones de papel, luego de aviones reales, y luego de las torres gemelas. Este proyecto de Diana López es un complejo aparato de enunciación cuya novedad consiste en no entregar cámaras, sino el ojo que dramáticamente reformula la pregunta y la subjetividad de cada niño. El placer de mirar lo que es digno de estudio, exhibición y archivo en estos últimos 25 años. Acá tengo una copia del libro y les voy a hablar un poquito del proceso. Eh, una de las cosas que más me emocionó de este libro fue el proceso colaborativo con Diana. Um, cuando ella, when she first approached me uh, to discuss this project and collaboration, she was really excited because she just had a box full of negatives. And I remember back in that moment, I was specifically really excited about digitizing negatives. So I digitized the entire box, uh, retouched the images, cleaned the negatives as best as I could. And that also gave me a greater understanding of what was um, on those sheets, what photos I thought were the most interesting. And overall, uh, being able to know to have a deeper sense of what her work was about, which is community, collaboration, and inviting other people to have a voice of their own. Um, the, I would call it, I won't call it a fold out, I would call it a dust jacket. Uh, the dust jacket, per se, has her silhouette, her silhouette from one of the photos that the children took of her. And on the back, the, you can find the text in both languages. Algo que fue muy importante en la realización de este libro, eh, tanto para Diana como para mí, fue mantener la integridad de los dos idiomas, tanto inglés como español, eh, ya que el libro se desarrolló no solamente en Estados Unidos, entre Washington D.C. y Nueva York, sino um, también en Caracas. Específicamente, Franklin, que eh, está acá, Estaba en Caracas y Gala, When You y um, Lucy, cuando uno está en público se le olvidan las cosas. Eh, y Lucy, y aquí pueden ver. Entonces, la idea básicamente era tener un volumen o un tomo para presentar de una manera más eh, espe especial o más. Eh, más enfocada el trabajo de cada uno de los niños. Y como bien dice el texto de Alejandro Castro, eh, Diana sirve como un puente o como el artista que da esta, esta posibilidad de que los niños expresen eh, la manera en que perciben el mundo. Los cuatro tomos están impresos eh, en duotono, fueron impresos por Javier Aispurua en las prensas de Editorial Ex Libris en Venezuela. Fue una decisión bastante... Eh, adrede imprimir en Venezuela, eh, a pesar de las complicaciones que puede eso eh, implicar. Y como pueden ver, los cuatro tomos están unhinged o sueltos, son pliegos sueltos. Entonces esto también reenforza o, o le da un poco más de énfasis al aspecto lúdico de la publicación, porque si bien cada niño tiene un tomo y está numerado, y la numeración es lineal y empieza en el 1 y termina en el ciento y tanto, eh, así como si fuese un diccionario en cuatro volúmenes. Eh, también pudiésemos decir que la manera en que está presentado permite juxtaponer o superponer estas visiones y fotografías de, de estas cuatro personitas que ya hoy en día son adultos. Entonces hay un, una diapositiva que en particular quiero enseñar, que es la última, hay, aquí hay algunas fotos del proceso, pero esta es la que particularmente quería enseñar. En la actualidad, Wen Yu es artista, 
que utilizó parte del archivo eh, de este proyecto de los años 90 para desarrollar uh, una exposición y parte de su obra actual. Entonces aquí tienen a Wen Yu en los 90, están las Torres Gemelas atrás, y este es Wen Yu en la actualidad, que por cierto ha publicado varios libros, y en el medio pone This is me. Entonces está incorporando como su yo de antes, y ella actualmente dice que este proyecto fue uno de los que más la influenció a convertirse en artista. This was one of the projects or the situations in her childhood that encouraged her the most to become an artist. Uh, en el medio, y a un lado vemos a Gala y a Lucy, y si ven, este, una de ellas conserva todavía la cámara que Diana les había dado, so she still keeps the camera that was given to her back then. So this was, I think, not only a project that was meaningful for Diana as an artist, but the way uh, to revisit the project um, currently has allowed us to see uh, a deeper impact across time and what it means to, you know, collaborate with children. Unfortunately, we couldn't contact Franklin. Eh, Franklin, este, no sabemos si todavía está en Venezuela o en Colombia en la actualidad, eh, pero estos cuatro niños y sus padres fueron eh, muy importantes en la vida de Diana y eh, creo que este es un proyecto además muy significativo sobre la naturaleza de... No, 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 no. Ah. <risa> sobre la, en la vida de Diana. En la naturaleza, the nature of her work nature of her work, which is community collaboration and, you know, oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, we have, um, uh, hola, okay, we have uh, uh, 15 minutes for questions. I hope that you made a lot of questions uh -huh. for us. Uh, I didn't, I said that I, I was from Venezuela I when I, yes. yeah. Like 20 times, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, if you have any question, Fantastic. if you want to to ask, I don't know, or make comments about any of the books that you just saw, we Personal are happy to, to answer them. We will be very, be very happy. <laughs> really. Sí. Okay. Hola. One question. Hi, um, my question isn't fully formed, but I'm just curious. Um, it was really interesting to me, Santiago, in the photo books that you were showing, the kind of space, the physical space the book took on and how it was very tied to the story the photographer was trying to accomplish. And I'm curious, in your process of developing the photo book, when does the, when does the way the, the book is going to take shape reveal itself to you? Is that early on or are you sequencing and putting it together and then you get the idea to perhaps in the Venezuelan hip hop book to have a fold out so it comes out? When does that unravel for you? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I always think that the process should be smooth in the sense that the photographs, the conversation that I always have with the authors, there are always hints, there are always uh, ideas that since the beginning are floating around. And to me, the first ideas are always the most important because they come from emotions, from reaction, from what you really feel. You know, it's are real to me. So I always try to follow those uh, vibes and in this book, photo book for example we knew that as the project is talking about being contained in the prison and then being free so for sure this book will be contained the first part the second should be free that's why it is free and because of that it, it is different than this one you know only because of this, you're telling something about the project itself, not only the object, but the project. And it should be always like a balance 
between concept and form, between idea and object. So yeah, and yeah, I can I can tell you exactly how every every book was being happening. For example, this one we wanted not to be very heavy, but we wanted to have many photos because we had to look through 43,000 photos of Federico photographing the FARC during 10 years. So the book is not, you know, it, it has a soft cover if you like, but it, we also wanted to, to have it in a mochila. A mochila is some, like a bag. Uh, like a bag, yeah. And yeah, like all the books talks somehow since the beginning to you and I'm really eager to to catch up that. That is a photo libro. That's the thing to add more like a more like a with the authors because the authors really have an idea and Santiago as an editor and a publisher also uh, enforce or put like a, a bright and things and also the designers is the saying it's like a we need each other exactly i mean it's and it's very good when you as a photographer you really like a match with a designer with a publisher because it's too many egos around <laughs> sometimes right <laughs> you um Hi. Hola. Eh, hola, me llamo Santiago, también okay. soy de Colombia. Hola. Mucho Gracias. gusto. Uh, so, I have a few questions. I don't know if I should just fire them off or maybe just start with one. I'll start with one. So, I'm wondering about, um, I think all of you talked about your work with photo uh, photographers and artists from all different countries in Latin America. And I'm, so, I'm wondering a little bit if you can talk about how you meet artists and photographers, how you find projects or if the projects come to you especially, you know, when they are, um, well, people from other countries, because it's not always easy to transcend, you know, where we live. Well, I mean, I can, I can answer that question also, you know, in the name of, of Santiago as a publisher, because, I mean, we have a lot of friends, uh, photographer friends, it, we, almost all the, I, I, have, I can say like a, almost all the photographers from Latin America, we know that because people we, that made amazing things are there. I mean, and are doing something. Also, social media is amazing to get there, them. But um, in festivals, uh, different is, right? It's like a, in countries and from Colombia, I mean, he, uh, published uh, authors from Colombia, but also from Venezuela, um, from Ecuador, and he is invited for uh, uh, festivals and uh, authors approach to him and show. I mean, even here in the in the fair uh, yesterday, I was some uh, uh, one author show me his PDF for instance, and uh, I mean, I all I'm always like uh, open to see the words from everyone and, yeah. and as a photographer or the editor yeah and the, and the the challenge is not to know the projects or the photographers because as luis said we we are seeing each other in in, in magazines or in the in the instagram or in the festivals i think the challenge is how to publish them how to finance the photo books you know, because it's not that easy. For example, what is happening here is amazing because people are really buying the books. Like somehow you are selling, selling, selling. And in other fairs in Colombia or in Ecuador or in Argentina, it's not that easy in the sense that you have to buy them. You, you, you need money for that. And so, sometimes that's the difficulty. For most of these books, we are doing crowdfunding. And somehow the crowdfunding has a spirit to support. You know, there is a confidence or there is like a, I want to support you and I will help you. 
because we know that it's very difficult to sell 1,000 copies of a book. Of course, with 150 or 200, you can finance the production, but to sell all of them, that will be a, 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 challenge. a challenge. Yeah. Okay. So it is always like an equation that you have to find out how to do that. Because if not, we will have, we will have plenty of photo books out there of so many stories uh, of uh, the diversity of what we can tell from from you know from colombia is amazing or from paraguay or bolivia but sometimes we need a little bit more and yeah i think to be here in this art book fair is um is the possibility to continue doing that to yeah to, to inspire others to hey we if we we are here for for sure others can can be and why not support each other to do that yeah yeah and it's very i mean it's very it's not easy to sell 500 books it's very complicated and when you what well, when you made it it's amazing too you want to add something Fadi? Okay. well another question we have like a maybe Five, five, five minutes. minutes. One, one, one more question. Okay, Veronica, so, hola. Hola. Um, my question, kind of, I mean, you've sort of answered, but I wanted to add how challenges can also make us creative and how any challenges that you might have found, like financial fi uh, challenges or that might have led to being creative in the design or changing materials and how can that also maybe be positive in a very unexpected way. Can that also happen? Hola, Veronica. Uh, Veronica supports a lot of Latin American artists, especially female photographers. And for example, the, the, the opportunity that you're giving to most of us is amazing because people can show their work in Japan or in New York and yeah the to to think about for example materials we were discussing with some of these books are printed in ecological paper that is made from the sugar cane and it is a little bit yellow it's a little bit rusty like grainy but it brings that idea to the project you see like for example this work of Luhan Agusti is about the women in Tierra del Fuego and this is an Antotipia and with the ink of the vegetables and nature she is producing this and for sure this project will not be the same if it is in a a white um, glossy paper but it needs this texture this kind of quality for sure could be a little bit cheaper if you like but it brings the message inside the project so yes the challenges are not only because of the materials but because the difficulty to show the work but because it's difficult to travel from one place to the other due to violence, due to poor roads. So we are always in that kind of struggle. And because of the struggle, new opportunities are, are open to come. Totally agree. <laughs> well, you want to add something? On the case of Diana's book, Libro de Diana, the eh, paper. El Papel. Um, some, of the, some of the formal decisions were delegated to what was available in Venezuela. Um, that goes from the material that was chosen for the dust jacket or fallout. In this case, it's canaleto, which is a very high quality material, but it's not what we had in mind first. So that also obligates you in a way to modify certain uh, formal qualities of the book from the way it's retouched to the second ink you might want to use for the um, duotone or the kind of 
pen tone that you choose to use so it doesn't look as dark because of the absorption of the paper being higher. Uh, in the case of the booklets, it was also a struggle because the paper that we wanted was not available for this size. So we went with a um, higher absorption paper. So that also required us to rethink the way that the photos were being uh, processed or how the preprensa was made, the prepress, especially for the different skin tones and the way the photos were taken since these children were, were not expert photographers, which is the case for most of the books that we have seen. Uh, sometimes the lighting conditions were not consistent or the contrast was very high or some photos were overexposed. So all of those uh, from the digitization process to the pre-press were very challenging components that were as well affected by the availability of materials. And if you see in the envelopes, there's a UV coating or a varnish that is the silhouette of each of the children. And that was also a choice that had to be made uh, regarding what type of paper was available. For example, if we were to have uncoated paper, we would have made it debossed, but since that wasn't available, we ended up using UV. So anything that you have at hand is what ends up becoming, you know, part of the identity of your book. And this book is no exception. Yeah, I mean, it's like a made all the crises in our countries made us more creative, and we did it. Thank you very much.
Michael, the you, you missed that. Oh no! <laughs> you know Carla, who's yeah. got the show. The friend of hers who came down was an opera singer, and he was sitting next to me, and, and I said, "Really, you're an opera singer?" And I, I wasn't trying to make him think that I. Right. And he just started singing, and the room just reverberated. Oh my God. It was exquisite. This was at the dinner. Yeah. Yeah. We In that tiny little place. Missed it. I always leave too early. <laughs> Good move, Collier. How did that sleep together again? No. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us with all the hullabaloo outside and uh, barbecue and partying going down. Um, this is kind of a wonderful moment because it's the first of our uh, podcast um, that we set up during the pandemic, but live uh, thought pieces. And I suppose this is post COVID or I guess we're not post COVID, are we? Are we, um, you know, alongside COVID and amongst COVID, we have this opportunity, a wonderful opportunity for three of our uh, authors to effectively um, contribute to the podcast, but in your presence. It has been recorded, so no swearing from the crowd, please. Um, to begin with, um, D'Angelo Lovell Williams is going to read from the text that he, that they've contributed to their own book um, as a start for a conversation uh, amongst the three authors. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, thanks, Michael, for that introduction. Um, I uh, was thinking how I would read these poems. Um, I remember recording them for the podcast, and uh, I like did it over and over again. So uh, bear with me. Um, this first one called Hang Time, I actually read at my grandmother's funeral after kind of editing it to fit the funeral um, setting, but uh, I feel like it resonates <laughs> in any moment. Um, here it is. Hang time. We must marry us. There's gravity and ripple time. Before life retreats, ascend the cascade. Drift down to one knee. New to ground softens the blow. The flesh of niggas was meant to be woven. The tree in your back sits across my mind. The roots in your feet mistake no hill. I grew limbs at the tips of my fingers to climb mountains from shared southern plains. A different coast renew my lungs, a pleasure this distance has gone. Digital, uh, digital technical difficulty. Um, a pleasure in this distance, our threats have gone, covered in swarms of presence and absence. A dark day, any dark day, I come to know, my name is spoken on your tongue. Image us into new postures. Uncradle our newborns into forgiveness. Lasting stains, I've slipped on down my high line. Fermented a silence only I could hear. Our black bodies hung so low. This is hell and back. Now our souls dine in divine tempest. We must marry us. This one is um, Backwoods. And many of my titles for photos and my writing is multi-layered. Um, so Backwoods, I'm thinking the actual a uh, paper that's used to roll weed, tobacco, a backwoods, but also like the backwoods of the country of you know the South um, that my grandmother lived in, that I spent a lot of time in. Um, this is backwoods. Break up with your friend. He ain't a nigga. I'm the nigga you see when the lights go out. 
Flame-sparked spectrum, we flare at every end. Excise me in a bed of no making. You are the longest yard. I am a mile unraveled. Still you throb at my slightest extension. A side of you, excuse me, reflections of nothing intention. The seed I give won't hurt next time. A side of you is my place of rest. Bring me pain that makes me feel better while I lay with you. As I bottom feed, no better joy comes to taste. No better joy comes to taste. I'd rather be a catfish than a mermaid because the mermaid is real. Because the catfish is real, excuse me. Eat me slowly because you love me. Deeper than crater, wider than mead, braised as the Bacchus woods, plump as plums on granny's trees, busty and lemon squeezed, my record of divine time is hanging on your walls. You like to swallow whole, but take time in me. Frisian in stride, stallion, stallion. More fearful than I thought I'd be. Running wild through passion pit pastures. Sing me a song in your berry voice. Tender and sweeter at the bridge. Drawers pulled down to get back home in nest of you. Say my name and I black light. You spread my thighs around your waist, our tongues wore incognito. Like the floating wet lotus of the Niles, excuse me, like the floating wet lotus of the Niles fertile ground, burying you was never an option. And I could read a third one, but for time I'll keep it going. Thank you. Those poems are spread, uh, sprinkled through D'Angelo's first book, uh, Contact High, um, which is an extraordinary kind of combination of photographs, text, and really a personal um, adventure, um, which is the first, hopefully, of many books that we'll make together. The two other people that I have sitting beside me um, one of them I've worked with for a very short time, and yet we've made three books. Um, the Argentine-American filmmaker and photographer, Alessandro Sanguinetti. Um, most recently, we've published a book called Some Say Ice, which is being launched this week in New York. And um, it is kind of one of the most uh, extraordinary photography books that I've been involved in. Uh, because of the prescient nature of uh, the work, the subtlety of her approach to the subject, which is really America, and uh, the narrative worlds that she spins through the kind of sequence uh, in the book. And the other really interesting thing about it is it's very distinct from the work for which she's world famous, which is uh, two books so far relating to uh, to the, the growth, the growing older of two young girls in Argentina. But we've made these books quite quickly in that short period of time. Yeah. Um, the other person um, sitting here is Collier Shaw, who's a very, very old friend and actually marks the history of my publishing in many ways because we began working at the very beginning of my career. And I've made, I think, some of the most important books through my time with Collier. And the most recent book that we've published uh, is picking up on a series which we began in 2004. Can you believe it? it's 2004? Um, which relates to uh, Collier's uh, relationship, if you like, with a, a, a small village in Germany. In simplistic terms, she will speak about it in much more coherently than I. So, but I'm going to give over to you to to begin the process, if that makes sense. Unless, Colly, you want to start perhaps by talking about your book, or do you want to? You know, it's funny. I, I, I'm so much more interested in talking about photography than I am about, um, I mean, maybe that's another way of talking about my photography, but um, I was thinking of, um, I, I was looking through 
your work just very quickly. Mm -hmm. And and I noticed that um, for the most part, there's there's not a lot of direct staring. It's like I can feel your camera looking and there's this observation. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes someone's looking, but they're not they're not looking and pausing in some way. And I was thinking about my work and there's so much kind of looking and scrutiny um, and very little observation. Mm. Because for me, um, observation feels dangerous because it's the camera becomes the sort of, you know, uh, covert thing that's moving around. And <clears throat> of course, like with photography, it's always a bad guy, no matter what it does, you know? And so the thing I think that I was interested in, 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 in talking about as a group or, you know, um, is kind of how we decide it's okay to do what we do and moments in which we're not sure, but we do it anyway. And then the editing process, which we decide do we show it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would sort of like frame it with the Arbus show around the corner, looking and sort of seeing like the total kind of stick, you know, sticking of the camera mm -hmm. in places that don't necessarily represent mm -hmm. the photographer. And, and, and yet it's in so many different places that it feels extremely normalizing in a way that the community um, is is so diverse that a drag queen or a lesbian couple seems regular and there's a part couple and there's a crying baby and all mm -hmm. those things so um, and I don't think our work necessarily maybe has you know that's a retrospective mm. of, or, or, you know, a, a big summary show. But I think about how we're three different kinds of photographers mm. with photography in common. Mm. And so I thought it might be nice to talk about, you know, how photography is dangerous and how we mm. get away with it. Because that was, it was in the heart of our conversations, wasn't it? The, if we're honest about the editing process. Um, your concerns about precisely that issue of the power of representation. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, depending on the body of work, I really approach the people differently with people I know. It's like with the girls, Gigi and Melinda, it's a whole different approach. But with some say eyes, I know that when I went there, I, I wanted to be... Um, what you said, I didn't want myself in the photograph. Like, I, I wanted it to be really straightforward. Just, I wanted it, I was deceiving myself because, of course, I'm there, right? But I wanted to feel like I didn't, that I wasn't direct, and I did direct, but that I wasn't directing. I wanted it to be simple, I didn't want it to be about my eye. I think I remember thinking that I don't want this to be about my eye because I already know I can take a good picture, but I, I don't know exactly what I was looking for, but I knew I didn't want that. So I just thought, okay, I'm just going to pretend I'm like the old time photographers that, you know, somebody came to have their picture taken for once in their life. And that was the only chance they got. So I imagine those local photographers didn't think, oh, what do I feel about this person? Or they just let the person present themselves and they did the portrait. And I tried to do that. I, of course, you know, I couldn't stay there. I couldn't help myself. But especially in the first visit, I just wanted not coldness because I can never feel coldness. I fall in love with every single person I photograph. And if I don't, then it doesn't work. It's like I immediately love the person in front of me. Um, but about the danger in photography, 
um, yeah, there's, I mean, it's dangerous and it's not. Sometimes I feel that we take what we do too seriously. You know, it's okay, it's dangerous, but it's not that dangerous. We're, well, it's it, just like a dick is not a gun, but it is. <laughs> yeah. There's power in that. Um, the photo, the image of it, there's a lot of power. In it. A lot and of both, power. Yeah. You know, and when it's talked about in certain ways, I mean, as my cover of my book, for example, I mean, I also didn't expect to be talking as much. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's like um, I was trying to relate this sort of power over my life, one's own life, with a gun, with sex, um, the body, uh, the black body in particular, the black figure. Um, and I think by doing that, I was able to kind of like participate in this conversation of, you know, why am I not seeing the penis, you know, talked about, shared, it's censored, there are reasons for that. So something as, you know, as simple as it should be to look at and talk about, you know, it's easier for someone to look at a gun in someone else's mouth than it is to talk about, you know, why there aren't more penises on the wall, why is, you know, why are there more women's body parts, why are there, you know, all of these things that have been historically okay to talk about. And that in itself, the dictation of that is a power that we haven't had for ourselves, you know. Um, but I, I, I do understand this sort of danger that can come along with making images of other people, of yourself. Um, it's like it's very, I mean, one, it's like all very like intimate and, you know, I wholeheartedly, you know, sympathize with falling in love with the people that I photograph, friend, family, lover. But it's also just like it's very dangerous when you're talking about making pictures of you know, things that other people haven't, you know, had time to, like, sit with and discuss for themselves and, like, how they feel about them. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of danger in that discovery, I think. That, that's really interesting, just this way in which we're, um, in, in different bodies of work, we're working with things that we know. Um, and we have a suspicion that they'll be sort of unusual for mm -hmm. other people. And then... We wonder what is it like when it sits in someone else's hands, and like, where's the kind of like what it's really like? Yeah, and like when I look at, um, you know, my my book and um, the books before it, and I think about my posture in Germany, and I think about kind of your work and your work. It's like I was bringing a lot of energy that I had to kind of um, hold back. Mm. You know, like, I, I remember when I first started taking pictures in Germany of this boy, um, my ex's nephew, and he was 13. And I just was thinking, how did Larry Clark get the clothes off of these people? And what's wrong with me that I can't, won't, don't do it. And, but I think about it, but I don't, you know, there's like such a line. And so to make work, I think when you are thinking about um, what everything, you know, what all these other pictures in the world have been, and then you're in this place, a town, and you're almost, you know, in some ways I felt like I was the only person thinking in the whole town. I know it's not true, but thinking like I was thinking, I'm sure that I was. And so everything that I was making was kind of covert. And, um, you know, if there was fetish, if there was s and if there was, um, you know, anger, it was carefully kind of, you know, like it was there if you were looking for it, but yeah. people might not see it. Um, and I think you know, talking about like the penis and, you know, there's like one naked boy in my book and I did not see that penis. I can assure you that, you know, I did everything I could to not see it because I was so sort of 
you know, shocked that I had this opportunity at the same time I was so far from pushing with my camera at that time. You know, it was like a real point of, um, like I needed a boundary. I think I was afraid yeah, of what it would be like to not have one. And, you know, and I've worked with uh, people closer to my age and or people in my community in the last several years. Um, I've been able to sort of push past that boundary because I'm pushing with someone else and I'm having a conversation with someone else. And it's, you know, the, yes, I'm the photographer, but um, it's really clear that who I'm working with is working with me right. and that we're talking about how we see things. And you have made a particular shift because you've actually started putting yourself into the picture, into the work. Is that a, an acknowledgement of this, of these sorts of issues? You know, I was just thinking of the Oedipal uh, process, Oedipal complex, and I was thinking that, you know, with the camera, there's something uh, about the, the subject wanting to um, kill the photographer and sleep with the camera, that, um, that the camera is this illicit object in between two intelligent people. I mean, for me, it, you know, it's about that kind of psychoanalysis of the, of the collaboration, the analyst and the annals end, mm -hmm. and the way in which, you know, an annals end can, can claim that the, the analyst has issues with them and is treating them in such a way that they're not acknowledging the crap that they're bringing. It is a collaboration. Um, so yes, like once I, once I put myself in my work or I was in my work, um, I thought, wow, this is really intense having this light in my face and the insecurity of being unsure of how I look mm -hmm. and then seeing myself and liking it sometimes, I think made me understand both the kind of stress and the, mm. the excitement and probably makes me a more um, subtle and understanding photographer. Mm. I just think you, you, you speak, when I think of work in photography, I'm just like, I'm thinking about your book. Like yesterday I, I I immersed myself in August and you're speaking about the process of photography and I'm just thinking about how devastating that book was, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like when I was looking at it um, yesterday and I had a little bit of a fever, so that probably influenced it, but like I could smell the dirt, the flowers, the death, the like the desire, the youth, and 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 I'm just immersed in that, you know. I and I know you're speaking to more the more conceptual, like what's behind the making of them, but that's where I am when I'm thinking about about your work, and also I'm like taking completely another place, but. Um, you know the poet Nicholas Randotti? A hunger. Because when I looked at the work, he's the one that came to mind. I Is was he like, the guy that photographed his boys? No, no, no. He, he was a poet, a Hungarian poet, and he died because it's connected to, to the work you're doing. Um, he was a Jew, and he died at 35 during a forced march through Yugoslavia. But he kept a pencil and paper in his pocket the whole time. And like the last four poems he wrote, he, he, they were called postcards, one, two, three, four. And the last postcard to me had so much to do with how I saw your book. Do you mind if I read that? It's sure. just like, I wrote it down because it's, I thought it was like, um, let's see. I'd like to know what you think. Hold on. Uh, it's really short. So the last postcard, which 
They found it after he died. He was killed in a ditch, and when they exhumed his body, his wife took the postcards out of his pocket. And it's, it's, this is how, this is what he wrote, right? This is how you'll end, just lie quietly, I said to myself. Patience flowers into death now. And this I'm going to say in German, which I don't know how to speak. Der springt noch auf. Der spring. I don't know. I mean, I'm afraid to say it. Um, the the spring so up, I heard from above me. So that's like this German soldier said that. Um, dark, filthy blood was drying in my ear. Um, and then the soldier said, wait till you see this guy break. Um, and from what I read, this phrase in German, the spring is also used to say like germination of flowers. So I'm sorry, I, I mean, I'm just, I, this is completely yeah. random, but it really spoke to me because it's like, you, I could smell that. Yeah, I, I'm going to respond to that. And then yeah. simultaneously, I have a question for D'Angelo. So it's going to, I'm going to shift it quickly over. Um, I often felt, feel like a bad Jew for making the work that I've made. I mean, there's just no way that that wasn't a kind of constant companion. And so I would read um, war and Holocaust books during my time in Germany. So I would be very conscious of, you know, more of the reality. And there was something really selfish about making the work. And it was a need to save myself from an identity determined by the Holocaust. And, um, you know, I really, it's like a wrestling angels thing. Like I really needed to um, not be down. I really needed not to be the bottom. I really needed not to be Anne Frank. I, you know, I needed not to be scared of, of blonde men. Um, I needed not to over identify with persecution. For me, that was like both a way to um, be in touch with my Jewish spirit um, in a less mournful way, and also to date a German, um, you know, which I successfully did for many years. Um, my question for you. And it's, I'm going to say it and hope that it's kosher. I was wondering what it feels like because I'm, I have had the experience, but I think in less, uh, in a more subtle way, I wondered what it is like to be making work um, with, about, by a black male body and black body amidst a lot of work um, that suddenly there's, you know, that you have some really interesting peers, like within an age span. And, you know, I've, I can remember making queer work and feeling like there were small, you know, Kathy Opie. There were like other queer bodies, um, but there wasn't that many lesbian pictures that were sort of not, you know, that were in the popular vernacular. And so I wondered what it, you know, so I had a lot of like privacy in a way, like I could represent something and it didn't have, you know, a chorus, it didn't have an opposition. And so I, I wondered if like how that affects you and what, what it's like. Yeah, it, it's a mixture of things uh, for me. I mean, I think about wanting to see something that, you know, wasn't one, just accessible to other people like me, and then wanting them to be a part of it in some way. So, like, anyone I photographed has, you know, come into my life through school, through friendship, through, you know, me exploring my own, just the world that I live in, and, you know, the places I go, seeing family, friends across this country, overseas. Um, and I spent a lot of time in like college, just like 
making images with strangers and not feeling any sort of attachment to them um, or the pictures that I would make. Um, and then that was like, you know, trying to like get to the point of making boundaries and giving myself boundaries and like specifying like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Um, and then telling myself then that it was one thing, but then realizing years later that it was totally something else. Like I was like, you know, I didn't feel this connection to, you know, my own culture. Um, growing up around black people and going to school, you know, predominantly black neighborhoods and just like, you know, not feeling certain things and then wanting those feelings through art and pictures and and even growing up with other artists, you know, just in school and thinking they would be here with me, you know, um, and then that not happening. So it's like, you know, what I thought would be there wasn't also. And I mean, again, a large part of my image making is a part of my, you know, uh, existence as a queer Black person and seeing how that history has been treated and overlooked in many ways. And, you know, my inspirations are not solely other people who have led the way or paved the way ancestors for me, but it's also like the results of what's already happened um, that we're still living with. So it's like, in a lot of ways, a response to the things that are here and then the creation of things I want to see. And that's kind of like coincided with uh, the people that I've met and like them just coming along on the journey with me. But I think for for me, the important part is, is, is really just like having the connection with the people and the images. Um, it feels safer. It feels comfortable um, in ways that kind of like, you know, I don't think about needing to make pictures for the sake of making pictures. I think of, you know, what what's the feeling? Um, what are the feelings that I'm trying to like get at? Uh, I was talking to someone at the, the talk we had the other night um, and they were a student and I was telling them or they were mentioning something that they recognized in the images. Um, and I was mentioning that I put people through it in my work a lot, just like, you know, holding a position, looking into the sun. So it's like you feel, I mean, it's not really intentional, but like you feel, you feel the work you are making in, in ways. So it's like you feel the feeling. You don't necessarily see that feeling, but the, the people in the work are as, as much a part. I mean, they're collaborators, um, but it's also just like, you know, it's larger than anyone involved really. Um, not to say that other work isn't, but it's also just like, you know, thinking about um, this sort of uh, what you were saying about um, not necessarily boundaries, but allowing yourself to sort of not um, to like not deny yourself to push yourself past the boundaries that you give yourself um, in the work. And uh, I think I don't necessarily, I mean, I go months without making images and it's like, it's a part of my, my, it's, it's a boundary for me where I get to like live and like enjoy the people who I am working with and who are in my life because I mean, they are important. They're like who the work is, you know, um, not only for, but they keep me going. They keep me, you know, inspired. Um, but yeah. Like it's a lot of it's a, it's a lot of things. Yeah. Still things that I'm like realizing as I continue to make work. Yeah. I was thinking I, I recently had a conversation with John Edmonds, mm. who's a former student, and and it was really um You just photographed him. Yes, I just photographed him. And he just photographed me and and it was it was really stressful. And then I, afterwards I thought, oh my god, this was just like perfect. Mm. But I, I remember really having a lot of anxiety about it, but we were talking about um, how we, our subject is so different, mm. you know, exact opposites, but our kind of anxiety, energy, desire is really similar. It's, there's a kind of, um, you know, and, and maybe that's in 
you know, thinking about what you set out to do in, is it Minnesota? Wisconsin? Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Um, and then thinking about the book. Like, it, it's really interesting to hear kind of, because it's not like a project like Disformer. It's not like you went to town and had everyone come and see you mm -mm. in a place. You went to all these places. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw the book first at, in the summer with Michael, and I immediately said I want that book um, because I thought it was really extraordinary. Uh, it's extraordinarily intrusive, and yet it's silent. It's like so quiet. And I, I can't, it's the kind of thing like, I can't imagine, you know, there are times when I literally can't imagine making someone's work. Like that's just not, it's not the kind of work. Um, I've made work where I wanted to make a picture that had certain ingredients of those pictures, mm -hmm. but then I kind of organized it mm -hmm. on, on some sense. Um, mm -hmm. But your thing is like, you went, with a certain idea of working and then, you know, you're kind of, I don't know how to say it, but like a bit of psychodrama, mm -hmm. you know, kind of comes out and you, you, you find and you search and. Um, I think that's also in the editorial process of putting the book together from the, the work you amassed, but you did have an idea, didn't you, of, of the sort of, because the inspiration was very particular to you, and the reason you went to Black River Falls was a specific historical reference. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a specific reason. And I, the first time I ever went to a place that I had no connection to, I felt I did. I mean, I did. It was in my head. You know, so, and when I was there, I, I felt that I had a right to be there because there was in my head that town had impacted me, you know, a long time ago. So, and I also knew I didn't have a right, you know, it was, there was this tension there, but I don't know. I think, I think that might be because, you know, my life, I just imagine what it's like to be other people. So, you know, as soon as I go into a situation, I don't even know why I'm going in there. You know, I don't know what I'm looking for. But um, it's my chance to just sit and gaze at somebody. <laughs> just, it, it's, um, sometimes they gaze back, sometimes not. But it was a very particular kind of energy between the people in me that I, don't, I didn't have in any other situation. Um, yeah. And, and again, going back to, to, to the idea of love, I, I, in the moment, I truly, I truly have affection for somebody that maybe I just met, and it, some pictures might be only 30 minutes, and during those 30 minutes, I feel so close. The other person has no idea, <laughs> you know, but I feel extremely close. And then afterwards in the editing process, you know, there's many images that I was very attached to, either because they were like really good portraits or they had this like weird little, whatever. But during the editing process, many of those were left out because it's just that fine line where I overinterpreted, where I overprojected, you know, and I just knew, and it's hard to, it's not tangible, it's, it's hard to explain why you know that, that that's not that person, even though I don't know them. You know, and also I don't have, I'm not including any context. So a lot of images without the proper context, the person would be completely misconstrued. Um, yeah, that must be, I mean, does that, yeah, do you have I mean, that as an issue in your work sometimes? I've been, I mean, I've been thinking about it more so lately and just like how I've come up with the images that I make. Um, 
I mean, sometimes people want me to photograph them, so it's not really like they care how like the resulting image would be. Um, and I mean, like, I never really know what will happen with images that I do make, but it's also just like I think of the things that I want to happen in the images before they happen. So it's pretty like specific. So whoever's in the image would be in an agreement to like do the thing or like, this is what we're making. But also, you know, um, I would really only photograph what people are comfortable with doing. Um, and I mean, I'm a director in that sense, uh, but I feel like after the images are made, um, like people feel differently about them, not necessarily like they don't want them to be shown or anything. It's just like they, it's, it's a different feeling after the image is just out in the world. Because when we're in the, like the process, I mean, even with myself, I'm just like, you know, I've, I've grown with myself a lot. I've uh, seen a lot of changes in my own body. I've photographed some of them. I've like, you know, realize a lot about myself through photographing myself but it's different when other people are involved and you can't really do that in like a, a sitting you know um so i feel like i challenge myself to 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 allow that that space and time to be more than you know it's not just any other day it's like this is also you know it's not a documentation of life but we're building we're making something that I would hope lasts longer than us, you know. Um, but more so, um, I mean, I haven't like really had that as, as a challenge, but I, I feel like that's kind of like got me thinking about how I will continue to make images with people because that is something that a lot of people, you know, do face with their own public image is like how they present themselves how others present them i don't let people photograph me like that so look at my book i mean i i constantly think about um at least two of those mm -hmm. kids dressed as nazis are um high school teachers in germany you know and i really uh i have like you know every couple of years i'll have like a burst of anxiety mm -hmm. that you know someone will see a picture and and have a judgment or an idea and um and i'm prepared for a moment in which that comes yeah. um you know it's the reckoning for photographers like it happens right to what about them what about them yeah no i mean well i mean they were 13 14 15 was, 16 okay, so now they're 17 yeah. 18 you know um i mean they did it for years um but I think that there's ways in which uh, I've been conservative um, in my work. Uh, but I, I do think that, you know, especially in our work. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have been in some ways as well. Just like. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're you know, especially like, uh, you know, some of my more recent work, um, you know, where I'm. I'm working with someone who is an artist themselves and um, right. and and it's like, you know, in in which way is this a kind of joint representation um, of the way we think about things and in which way is it uh, a look at what it looks like when one person takes a picture of another person and, um, you know, where the vulnerability lies and right. where the truth in fiction is and you know, in the end, it's really, you know, it would be a discussion in which that would be fleshed out. It doesn't get fleshed out in the work alone. The work doesn't have that voice. So it's... I, um, I, I mean, I didn't really realize this when I was first photographing some of the people that I was photographing. Um, but, like, in photographing people over and over, it's like, I've seen a lot of changes that I, I didn't expect. And then it's, it's a part of people growing, like a lot of people that I photographed, well, not a lot, but a few people I photographed are now trans and they weren't trans identifying when I photographed them and some were, but there are a few who weren't. And then just like being a part of 
their journey and you know transitioning and also just like knowing that they don't want me showing certain images of them you know pre um transition and understanding that like you know there are certain um there are certain uh i guess representations of ourselves that we want to be seen regardless of that's in an image by someone or someone else but then there's like the the representation we have at large that we aren't really in control of and that's kind of like i feel like that's what the photographs help you know the photographs help tell the narratives that you know the the media yeah i, I think takes away from us i think it's really important as a photographer to come to terms with um people saying no or people saying yeah. no later um people changing their mind people saying no people saying no people oh, yeah. or people wanting to you know it's like it's it's amazing when you feel like you're allowed to own your work mm. and and it's heartbreaking um and very much part of being a photographer when that's challenged mm. and you know it can be occasional it can be once or twice but it's it's a very specific kind of feeling and it's really important because once you sort of process through that having to give up a particular picture uh it becomes easier to understand that it isn't all yours right. even though it's in your hands i think that's a beautiful point at which to open it out to the floor i don't know if anybody would like to uh, ask any questions I'd like to just hear a bit more from Alessandra about this experience of loving your subjects and how you understand that. Like, what is that? Does that have to do with people making themselves vulnerable, offering themselves up to you? Um, what I just like to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, I I don't know if I have a good answer. Um, you know, sometimes I, if I have assignments or maybe I set myself out to photograph certain people, um, if I don't, it's intangible, you know, if I don't like them, if I don't like what they stand for, or if I get, if I, I can't photograph them, you know, I tried, I don't remember what, for what assignment it was white supremacist, something like that, you know, I can't do it. I can't, I, I, I can't photograph people that I can't have any empathy for. Mm. Um, at the same time, you know, maybe I could, maybe it would be interested, interesting if I push myself, because I could probably find some empathy there, but I have enough with, with all the others that, um, I don't know, it's a hard question to answer because it's really, it's just, I've always just stared at people, gazed at people. I remember being like in second grade and looking at the little girl next to me and just looking at her and then I blurted out, you look so special, you look so intelligent. And she yeah. looked at me like I was like this weirdo. And I remember it because I felt so ashamed, you know, and, I knew never to do that again, you know, not to like, but that's a little bit how I feel um, when I'm photographing. You know, it's, love is a big word, but um, I don't know what other word to use. Even when I'm making the portrait and then when I'm editing it, um, it becomes it becomes close to me. I, I, it's hard to explain. I'm sorry, I can't be clear about it, but. I think we get crushes on crushes. our pictures. Crushes. And crushes <laughs> on, and, and I've really come to, uh, you know, try and taper off of the over-identification and, and love because I started to feel like the little old woman, you know, who had too many children in a shoe. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, there's only so many people you can. <laughs> 
really like and love and that it, I kind of was over being over promiscuous in my emotional kind of transference with people I was taking pictures with and I couldn't follow through on that much love. Um, but that said, that's for strangers. I usually don't photograph the people I love love <laughs> that much. You know, I haven't analyzed on this. I'm just blurting things out. But I, I don't photograph my family that much anymore. Um, I feel, it, no, I feel I'm, it just, it's too much. And I know them too well. You know, I can't, I can't put myself in there, you know. Um, yeah, maybe I'm revealing too much, but yeah. It, uh, I, I feel that. Um, I think for um, a lot of my life just growing up, I mean, I didn't start out as a photographer. Many people don't know this, I guess, but... Um, I had always been doing everything else, drawing, painting, sculpting, ceramics uh, since like fourth grade. I mean, drawing even earlier than that, but um, photography was introduced to me in high school and it, I fell in love with it, trying to make, you know, all these otherworldly things, images, surreal, very like heavily photoshopped. Um, but I think where I am now is like trying to sort of have this conversation about humanity and shame and not being like shameful of how I feel, the things I see, the things I want to see, um, because that's kind of been our lives that we've been given to just be like ashamed of the things that we like to do and like, you know, the people we love. And I feel like images have allowed me to like get past that. So. Wonderful. One last question. We're actually out of time. Sorry about that. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Dan Macklin. I'm the founder and executive editor of Future Poem. Um, and um, I'm going to let uh, the, the, I want, first, I want to thank David Sr. and everybody at um, Printed Matter for inviting us to do this classroom presentation. I really, really, um, to mark our 20th anniversary. So it's been, it's a really um, wonderful acknowledgement of the work that we've done. So I want to um, uh, turn it over, just have a, everybody on the panel give them, give a brief introduction about how they're involved in the press and who they are. <laughs> so maybe starting with Tom going. Hi, I'm Tom Griffiths. I've been, uh, I'm very close to the mic here. Um, <laughs> I've been working with Future Poem for a number of years now, and I have a a small studio uh, with Jessica Green, my wife. And yeah, we do a lot of the book covers and we kind of help with bits of the identity like like this catalog. And yeah, I've been working with, with Dan for many years now. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mirena Arsanos and I am a future poem author. Um, we just launched my book, The Autobiography of a Language, um, two days ago. And um, yeah, it was <laughs> selected, um, I think, in the 2019, for the 2019 contest, uh, Other Future uh, Award, Other Futures Award, I think. And, um, and we just released it um, now. So yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, is the mic on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Monica de la Torre. I'm a poet. And um, I have been involved with Future Poem for a very long time as a board member, current president of the board, and guest editor. Um, I guest edited the, there we go. Yeah, no wonder. I was like, is that mm -hmm. me or is something actually not on? Um, uh, yeah, I was on a panel a couple years ago. So I've been with the press for, I guess, over 15 years for now. Yeah. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I'm Farnoosh and um, I was a guest editor two years ago for the year after Moraine, so 2020, and um, also a poet and just a longtime friend and fan of Future Poem. Hi everyone, I'm Jay Sanders, also a longtime friend and fan of Future Poem and a board member since 10 years, thanks to Dan and Monica bringing me on. So, and I'm uh, the director of Artist Space when I'm not here. Um, yeah, and Jay just invited us to have this wonderful event for Moran's book and another author on um, this past Wednesday, and it was it was amazing. So, um, thanks, Jay, for that. Um, and uh, I want to start our discussion. And one of the things that um, I'm proud of to say about Future Poem, and I think which makes us kind of unique and ties us into a lot of um, other kinds of art projects that have a collective approach is, is sort of our editorial model. So we, rather than kind of a few permanent people who kind of choose all the books, we have um, kind of an idea of a community-led uh, editorial model. So we have a rotating panel of three people that we invite, and these can be poets, curators, we've had kind of experimental playwriters and um, critics and um, our board, um, you know, helps select those people. So in a way we have an indirect, a little bit of an indirect approach to curatorial. We choose the curators and then they in turn kind of interpret our vision about what is future poem and choose, choose different kinds of books um, that they feel are the best work to put forward right now. So um, I kind of am um, interested in hearing people from their different perspectives talk about that. But, um, uh, you know, I just want to say that, that, you know, so we've 20 years and we've had like 40 or 50 different, um, probably 50 different curators, guest curators by now. And it's been a really interesting, diverse group of writers and artists 
and um, you know, it's kind of involved the approach and, it's, and the work has evolved as well. But um, I'm curious about um, maybe a good place to start would be um, both Monica and Farnoosh at work guest editors. And I would love to hear what you guys, yeah, what your, what your experience was with that and how you, what you, how you felt when you came to it and sort of what your experience was after you did it. Should we talk at the same time? <laughs> that would be very experimental. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, sure. I, um, yes, I had never participated in any kind of collective manuscript reading with a group before. Um, I had been like one judge about, among others, sort of behind the scenes, but this is very different. And once I experienced it, I sort of felt like this is how all all good books should be discovered um, because first of all, it's a, a tremendous honor and really unusual for there to be such like trust in outside people. Um, and so this sort of invitation in of itself felt like it really motivated me to think about, you know, the conversation and the model. And I was paired with um, Rose Alcala and, um, uh, Marie Buck, and the three of us are extremely different poets. Um, and so it was just super interesting, right? Like it reflected back to me that this was a conscious choice to bring three very different writers together who all somehow um, could see future poem as a place where like the poetry of interest for them was happening as a reader or as a writer. Um, and so it, it, I just, I think this idea of like future poem as a title isn't just, a, it's not just like a title or a placeholder. It is very much like reflected in the guest editing model where it's like, we don't know what the next book is going to be. It will depend on these people. So instead of sort of like editors trying to build out a press that reflects diversity, you know, um, the di diversity really is just what's published reflects the diversity that's out there that they bring through the guest editors and the differences between the editors. Um, and I just think that that's so rich and really exciting. And, and, you know, we chose different poets, but we all ended up agreeing on the winners, you know, and, and what that did for me was it helped me see sort of a different perspective of like a different sensibility um, who could also really, understand and appreciate what I was interested in, but just from a different angle, totally different angle. I think it's really healthy, you know, for poets and, and other kinds of artists to have those differences and be able to collaborate. And it was also just one last comment that like Dan and Carly and Ariel like just held the space for us really beautifully. Um, I was like, what? I would not be able to sit still. I'd be like, pick that one or don't pick that one, you know? Um, but uh, there's just so much respect and care and guided us through the process really beautifully. And I don't know if it would have been as successful if we hadn't had their sort of guidance and, and the setting up of the process for us. So, and uh, just, did you do it in person? Or on Zoom? It was on Zoom, it was, Zoom. yeah, 2020. Right. So I was on the panel um, in 2021, and it also was on Zoom. Um, my fellow panelists were Hannah Black, the artist and writer, Hannah Black, and Ken Chen, who's a poet and former director of the Asian American Workshop. Now, uh, I think he's the head of creative writing at Barnard University. And um, there were a number of things that were just absolutely uh, incredible about it. One that... Um, as Farnoosh was saying, the type, the diversity, of course, was manifold. So there was diverse, diverse takes on diversity, um, which is to me crucial. Um, first, in terms of like disciplinary approaches, degrees of uh, professionalism, not, not professionalism in terms of like one's work ethic, everybody was incredibly professional, but they weren't professional in the field of like editing books. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings a freshness um, to the to the conversation and, and like a passion that um, is I think the hope is very palpable in the books mm -hmm. um, and 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 uh, the other thing that was really impressive about my fellow panelists was like everyone's like really passionate really passionate about the books um, that they choose so I often make a frequent mistake when I do these things 
I think that whatever I think is like so obvious, like this is the book, <laughs> like it's so good. This is right. And, and then I'm in conversation with people. I'm like, wait, what? You don't, you don't think this book is absolutely brilliant. And this is a book that needs to be published. And that's when the conversation gets super interesting because I start seeing other books that I read, you know, under very particular lenses or my own particular lens and filter, uh, with with other eyes and it's it's just so revelatory so um in the end i think our process was it yielded a very interesting uh it, it, a very interesting book that will be out um next year yeah, yeah by wendy lotterman and and it was the book that we kept talking about we just couldn't not talk about it so we would talk about the other manuscripts. And then it was like, but Wendy, and, and then all of a sudden we realized, hey, we're all talking about this. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last thing I'll say about this is, um, I have had experience, as I said, doing these things in very formal situations and for institutions mm -hmm. and things. And apparently there's like a, a thing that, that people do uh, where they have a strategy. So knowing that people get really passionate and mm -hmm. that often there's like very different takes and um, in terms of like aesthetics and poetics and stuff. So people have a strategy and they always advocate for their, not the, the, the book, their, their, their top choice, but the second or third choice so that they don't antagonize the fellow panelists. <laughs> have, have you heard of this? Yeah. Because if you say you're like a radical experimentalist and someone else says like, no, 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 I'm a formalist. And so then if you pick the, the, the most radical book, then everybody will be like, no, well, of course we're picking that one because we'd be, <laughs> so then you'll settle for another book in between. So, People are really good at this. And of course, we were not good at this. Uh, and that was what was great, that we weren't being strategic. We we're just being like super genuine and passionate about um, the conversation that I haven't had anywhere else, actually, mm -hmm. in terms of like what's out there and what what poetry is and should be doing mm -hmm. and why publish a manuscript right now, you know? And mm -hmm. it was just really rewarding. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear from Miranda as the artist uh, who was selected during that process. And then I, I'd love to talk a little bit about design after that. So, but, um, but um, Miranda, I'd love to hear what your experience was and how sort of being chosen by a panel of, of these three um, curators, how did, what did that feel like? And, and um, how did that make your experience as being selected as an author different? What was the last part of your question? Oh, just, you know, kind of did that make a difference? Did it, was that significant to you to be chosen by these three particular people? Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to hear Monica talk about the behind the scenes kind of selection process. Uh, I was very curious about um, what happened when they selected Laura and, and my book, which are also very different books. Um, and somehow were chosen by the same editors. So I wonder how that um, played out, um, or what, what happened in the, um, what the conversation was about. Um, but if I have to talk about my experience, um, well, um, this is the first book I publish here in the United States. And Future Poem is, is um, I submitted to this contest. Um, I think I was kind of, um, eight months pregnant or something. And, and I received, well, no, I submitted before, but I, I received an email saying that I was selected, um, just before giving birth. And I saw this coincidence as like very, you know, um, how do you say that? Um, auspicious, auspicious exactly. I want to say ominous, but that's not the word. <laughs> so uh, auspicious. And um, so I was very happy, of course. And uh, and as you were talking, Don, um, um, I don't know who was saying that, but someone was um, talking about time. And and I was just thinking about time in relationship to the title, like the name of the press, Future Poem. And um, so my book was selected just before the pandemic, like uh, towards like the end of 2019. And then the pandemic hit. And um, it was like a three-year process. And I have to say that I'm very happy it took that long and that there wasn't this obsession with like, you know, this kind of uh, production-oriented timeline. Like, let's get this book out no matter what. And I feel like there's this kind of freedom with maybe the the 
yeah, the way, a particular way of approaching temporality within the press that allows for that kind of elasticity. And, and I'm so happy that we launched it three years after it was selected and that we had a real launch that felt like really good. Um, and yeah, I just feel, I also felt like even throughout the pandemic, really supported by the team, um, I worked in particular with Ariel and Carly, who were really delightful to work with. Um, and yeah, it felt that um, the support was there, even if the action was not happening. And um, I was really grateful for that, um, that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thanks, everybody, for... Um... Uh, I wanted to get to the other thing I'm proud to say I feel distinguishes our publishing, which is our design sensibility. And um, I don't know why, but from the very beginning, I, I founded the press with a designer just as a side project, said, let's go make a book. And then um, we made another book. And then we decided to do this collective approach, which kind of opens it up a lot. Um, but the, we had a, have always kind of worked with one designer or studio. And so the first one was Anthony Monahan, um, who designed these first um, two books that it was kind of an illustrative approach. And it was like a big conversation. We were going to do a different approach first, but he came up with the idea of this six by eight trim size, which is we stuck with. And so they all kind of all the books to this day kind of are the same size. And these are there's Moren's book <laughs> and just came out and uh, Lara Jara Milo, um, her book and um, this one by Lindsay Choi. Um, so they've we've kept with that book size, but we've had was Anthony Monahan, then it was Jeremy Mickle. And then for as long as I can remember now, it's been a while I've been working with Tom and Jessica at Everything Studio. And they've, I think what I've learned over the years is kind of stay out of the designer's way. <laughs> I think, I, you know, you give them a direct relationship with the artist. Um, you give input where you feel like you want to give input. But it, it, largely, I really feel I'm, I'm so happy to have met Tom and Jessica and, and to kind of develop a a relationship they get kind of get what what our authors need but every book is kind of different in a fresh approach so i'd love to hear from tom about his experience um working with us and what you know anything you'd like to say about it yeah um i think i changed uh, changed as a designer when i started working with future poem at the beginning, I had, you know, I was very ambitious and I thought I could just kind of roll in there and just do really cool covers. And I figured, you know, I mean, the rest of the poetry world, it doesn't seem like graphic design is a particularly important <laughs> value for most poetry presses. Well, that's that's unfair, but you know, you know what I mean. It's not like, you know, if you go into the poetry section in the bookstore, it's not like going into the, like the architecture book section. It's just a different thing. Um, and then I was, yeah, so I went in with that kind of, that kind of, uh, kind of, I don't know, ambition to do something. And I think that it was, I just, it didn't really work. And I think that a lot of it was that I wasn't really um, communicating with the author enough and it didn't feel like a collaborative enough process. And I think that it's, I, I really like, kind of been swept up in the kind of spirit of future poem, just because, you know, I've been working with, you know, Dan and, and Carly was, uh, was kind of, uh, you know, important as, a, as a, an intermediary between me and the, and the author. And really it's like a, a kind of a thing kind of developed over the years. I don't know if you kind of feel the same way, but it was like, the, like future poem books, like in, term, in terms of the visual language, in terms of the kind of spirit of the, the design, I think that it evolved and it turned into it into a, something which is kind of distinctive and not it's not something that was necessarily driven by me but it was just about responding to the brief about talking with authors um so yeah i mean uh it's it's interesting like with uh, Moren's book like i mean with this design for example it was 
um, I think I came in and, you know, from the first meeting that we had, it was, you know, I, I, you had a really nice brief and I was like really kind of inspired by it. And I was kind of showing you stuff that I'm into and we, we seem to be sort of meeting in the, in the middle somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then I presented that first round and you're like, yeah, that's, that's nice, but that's not what I want. And, but you did, but what was interesting is that you saw something that interested you in it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I feel like what happened next was like, this is when what I gets me really excited is it's like the design doesn't really feel like it belongs to me or to you. It's just a thing which has its own internal logic and just kind of mm -hmm. uh, develops on its own. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I just want to add to this. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting experience working with Tom. Um, and I think I've only worked with like two quote unquote, like real designers. Uh, in my life and and um, designers, I feel like have a very, um, you know, everything has a meaning in design and, the, and working with Tom, like, you know, you, you, you design with also like a certain history of design in mind and, um, and that I personally wasn't familiar with, but I understood where you were coming from. And when you, you know, after our first meeting, when you sort of showed me the first, um, you know, the first sort of uh, attempts at, at the cover, um, I was, um, I was, I, I, I definitely saw something, but I also, I also didn't feel that it was for my book or it didn't, it, it wasn't yeah. like, you know, like I felt like, oh my God, this is, this is a little too far away from me. Um, and, um, I respected the craft, the, the professionalism and everything. And what I really appreciated was your, um, the, your flexibility, right? Your openness to, to, to sort of think together of a form that, uh, would still kind of, um, reflect the press's like graphic imprint or approach or philosophy, but also accommodate my, my own sort of vision, right. For the, for the book. So I, I really, I'm really happy that, um, yeah, that, that conversation was very, uh, productive for me. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you guys. Um, uh, I, I'm going to jump to the subject of experimental literature, experimental bookmaking or whatever you want to, um, Experimental literature, you know, that's kind of how we thought of ourselves when we started. I actually want to ask Jay his opinion on this, because I think Jay comes at it from like a, a curatorial perspective of someone who's been very involved with poets. And I'm curious about, um, you know, what it, what you how you thought of the press, if that word had resonance for you when you got involved and, you know, sort of how that way, how you see it today, maybe a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And I feel like others can maybe answer it too, who are more, um, even more adept at poetry than me. Um, but yeah, I mean, my real attraction to the press, some of which we've talked about is the kind of inbuilt experimentation of the form. And I think like it's as someone who's a curator, it's very radical that the, um, structural system is that the publisher isn't choosing the books that they're, it's actually practitioner led. And I feel like, um, as someone that, comes from the art world where it's a bit sometimes more curatorial led and a little more professionalized. I see in say experimental writing communities or in an experimental music communities like practitioners as curators much more and sort of playing those different hats in those contexts. So I guess I, and I trust, I guess, a writer's opinion of a book and what the sort of future of writing can be more than a curator's. So I guess I'm, I'm was totally inspired to join Future Poem to learn from that editorial board and how the books would be generated. And I would say so many writers that I've come to love, um, I saw their first book as a future poem book, like Simone White or someone like the, that book was a real revelation and you know, that you all published, or I remember Dana Ward's book at a certain point, like meant a lot to me. So, so, you know, I feel lucky and a bit like I'm gaining a lot as, um, by having an affiliation. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think like the, that process also means it's sort of always on the front line because it's an ever rejuvenating series of readers and people submitting books and that the imprint of the press is not so overarching where like, except for the trim size, like the books actually look very radically different and kind of inventively unique to what they are. Um, so yeah. So I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of lauding the press, but avoiding the question maybe. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Good um, job. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
maybe um, I don't know if um, Monica or, or you have any thoughts or, or Farnoosh um, or any, anybody would like to talk about um, just, yeah, the idea of experimental literature. I mean, is it, does it feel like that's what we do? And, and does that feel still how, what's, is there a better way to think about what we do um, than when we, when we started? Cause that maybe had a lot of relevance when we started, but it maybe is, has a different resonance now. Well, um, I'm, my, my thoughts are very much along the same lines as Jay's um, in the sense that I think what the press does really, really well is avoid the trappings of experimental as an aesthetic. You know, the minute that becomes a recognizable aesthetic, mm -hmm. then it starts being uh, manufactured. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about Future Poem is that the experiment is the protocol so it's like just thinking of cage, for instance, that's really helpful to me. Whenever I think of experimental, like a series of actions, um, a series of actions whose outcome is unknown. The actions are always the same, right? It's like people submit at a particular date. There's three editorial, three members of the editorial panel. Uh, key to the process and the protocol is that often it's a multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Uh, panel, which is essential to me. In fact, um, that's, I don't think of, I, I can't think of another press that does this. So there's been playwrights, as, as Dan said at the beginning, there's been playwrights on the panels. There's, there's been uh, um, uh, our, our choreographers yeah. like Miguel Gutierrez chose an incredible book, Renee Gladman, Seth Price. Um, so like how many presses are actually doing that? And it's just, just to, just to question this notion that the only people that care about poetry and read poetry and would have something to say about poetry or poets is seems like massively important, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it turns out that a choreographer and poet like Miguel Gutierrez has a lot to say about poetry. And Hannah Black is an artist who also has a lot mm -hmm. um, to contribute to um, mm -hmm. poetry. And uh, someone like Seth Price is, a, is a, an artist who a lot of people here at the fair know, but he's also a really great writer. So just to question that already intervenes the discipline in a very mm -hmm. interesting way. And um, so, yeah, back to the protocol keeps, it's, it's always the same and, and yet it keeps generating a new, a new manuscript, a new book, new books that uh, we couldn't have predicted. So there's a very interesting tension for me between continuity and discontinuity. There's like continuous discontinuity or discontinuous continuity and future poem is keep, keeps getting redefined mm -hmm. as a press based on the books to come, mm -hmm. as opposed to there being an editorial line that then everything needs to be shoehorned into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm taking a left turn. I, I um, just kind of your your conversation and reminded me of uh, the fact that Farnish you spent time in Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just kind of feel like that's a very interesting. Um, there's a, such an interesting tradition of experimentalism in in Brazil, and and um, and I'm just you know I love maybe this is a good sort of merger into this other thing i was uh you know like we started as a new york city local press we became a national press with occasional international submissions now, and now we have some authors living in europe um i'm going to germany on monday to to go to berlin and frankfurt to like talk to translators and stuff and so i'm curious about like we i think we have an idea that we want to explore becoming a less U.S. centric press. I'm, I'm curious about if like you or anybody else have ideas about like, what's the right way to do that? Or what should we be doing that? Or how, how should, how is, what's important to, for us to be thinking about? Um, thank you. I also think Monica as a more seasoned translator might have, have something to add also, but, um, but I think, yeah, I love that idea. I love the idea of instead of people submitting works of translation to the press and the press also publishing translations, like who are the contemporary poets who are future poeming in other countries? Um, like when I was there, my friends became like, well, who's a poet and what are the small presses? I mean, they're, it's a small world um, and they are reading, you know, books published in the US. And so there, it's kind of like what you were saying about artists outside of different disciplines are invested in different disciplines, are invested in poetry. And yet we, we tend to sort of think that we're like an insular, like, you know, 
nobody cares perhaps like it doesn't sell or something and only to poets and we're like glad martyrs or whatever um but um but it's not true and i think that also applies to re readers outside of the states where like small presses are looking to connect small presses in other countries and to be translated and um <sighs> You know, I think if everybody kind of banded together and just said, like, who do you know who writes, you know, in another language who's really interesting, who could be a good future poem editor or a future guest editor or a future poem writer? I just I think that that conversation would um, be really productive. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about I was trying to think about examples of of course, there's like there are like book fairs. Um, there's like the, the Dubai, the Dubai book fair. I'm, I'm thinking of like book fair that have this kind of, in, you know, global reach. Um, and often because, um, the overlaps with the art world, I feel the art world, you know, like a document, I think there was a kind of whole section on like, um, independent publishers. And so I feel like, you know, art events are good at good. They also have the resources to sort of invite like, you know, a tiny press from Tunisia, for example, and, um, and yeah, I feel like um, that would be an interesting model, like how, you know, to gather like, yeah, small presses from, from different countries. But also it was just, I was thinking about geography and how to position a book. And I was thinking about blurbs as a way of creating a map of the names that you bring into the conversation and blurbs having their own geographies. Um, and so if you think about like, my blurbers, um, uh, I ask Iman Mersal, who's um, an Egyptian poet, contemporary Egyptian poet, who's very respected um, as, as a poet. Uh, and, but, but I don't think that Iman Mersal is known to the audience of the small press, of the, of the future poem audience. And so how to bring in names that are not, um, that are not necessarily um, circulating within that, that sort of network um and then monica for my book which i'm very grateful for and omar berada who is um um a curator and a, a poet as well who also has this kind of internationalist kind of um positioning let's say but yeah just blurbs as as geography mm -hmm. um <coughs> does anybody else have anything to say about that i was gonna um talk a little bit about like the future of future poem or like where where other ways that we should grow at. one thing i was going to do is um we did this really turned out to be um a project we were all really um, um excited about um oh i'm not sure what what um share uh, let's see slideshow okay Maybe this will work. Okay, so this was um, a postcard project. We were looking for ways to fundraise and our board, Monica and Jay included, came up with the idea of like inviting different artists and writers to talk about like what other messages to the future people. And this was in 2012, so it's exactly 10 years ago. And um, we got um, some very interesting and surprising, um, wonderful, like responses. Everybody got like two blank postcards and they literally mailed it to, to us. So, um, um, but basically, um, that was just an entree into, you know, what are, what are, I would love to hear, like maybe Tom, you haven't talked in a bit and I'd love to hear like, where would you like as a designer to, to see you've been doing it for a while, like what would you like as a designer to see, you know, happen, you know, that would be interesting to you um, to engage with um, and, you know, that we haven't been before. Yeah. Um, what to do next? Well, actually, I don't have, in terms of my relationship with the, with the press, one of the things that I really appreciate is that it doesn't seem like you're really that interested in marketing at all. You're not about shifting units. That's never been a consideration. And I think that's, you know, I've, I've worked with other publishers and that's all they talk about. So one of the things I really want you to preserve, you know, preserve going on into the future is that <laughs> it's, the most, it's the most important thing. And um, yeah, like it's, I, I just think that there's, there's a kind of a, yeah, as a spirit of of 
future poem that it just sort of needs to be protected, even if, you know, no matter how sort of whatever the future may hold, however successful you get, there is something which is just about just doing something in a very pure way. <laughs> That's all I can say, really. Um, Jay, um, do you, I'm interested because you're somebody who's, you know, for example, at artist space, like brought, you know, evolved, you know, something out of the history and, and brought your own kind of vision to that. And, you know, um, with other ways that you'd like, you, you think it would be, and, you know, everybody said that they really admire the, the model of the press, but I'm curious if there are ways that you'd like to see it sort of expand or grow and. That's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I also kind of like um, it's like s celebrating it as it is, but um, yeah, the the sort of like non-commercial and non-marketable approach um, I think is inspiring. That like the books aren't chosen on those terms. Um, I guess it comes to mind like the collaboration, and maybe Dan, you could say more about it. But like the speak the speech acts book with ICA Philadelphia, um, that Future Poem did that Meg only edited. I thought that was a very interesting collaboration of like looking at um, language-based art practices at a certain moment. So I think there's, it seems like there's been moments where like a portal opens where the press is a very good collaborator. And I think that maybe those kind of opportunistic, those serendipitous moments are really nice when we can do them and when, you know, have the resources and the, and the, and the tether sort of makes sense. So that comes to mind, like maybe projects like that. Yeah, there was a serendipitous thing that um, Meg only um, just kind of out of the blue said, you know, I love your books and I love everything studio, by the way, um, Tom. And uh, and I love the design, the books, and I like I love the work you publish, like Simone Wade in particular. It uh, been something that's important to her. So, um, you know, and she wanted us to be co co-editors um, of the catalog for the Speech Acts exhibition at the ICA uh, University of Pennsylvania. So that was a um, really um, wonderful exhibit, important exhibit. And um, and we were, you know, and there was a writing component to both the exhibit and the catalog that um, Simone's work was in there and Harriet Mullen and a number of others, uh, Fred Moten. Um, so we're really proud to, to be co-publishing that. And she really wanted the collaboration of somebody who had been present and sort of um, supported uh, black experimental poets in particular. Um, so I think that um, that was a really wonderful, like surprising thing, as Jay said, that it just sort of an opportunity opened up and we kind of went out of our comfort zone a little bit and, and collaborated on it. And it was, it was a really wonderful result. So um, I hope we're kind of like, hope we can look around or, that those things, you know, be open to those things as they come, come and come to us. I love the idea of um, Maren's idea of like giving blurbers the opportunity, like doing something so that the work of the blurbers that's not available in English, for instance, becomes translated, maybe in an accompanying little pamphlet or something. Like I'm really good at thinking of things that are not marketable and that will <laughs> not generate a lot of funds, but maybe actually cost more money. But hey, wouldn't that be amazing Like to actually have little companion books or little companion pamphlets for the books with, yeah, with work in translation or like, yeah, just like keep building on the constellations. It'd be really fun. Um, I, I think we got the cue that we would like to open up the discussion for um, questions um, in, the, in our remaining time. So um, um, does anybody have a question they would like to ask us? Or, or we can keep talking. Or <laughs> Have ideas? Oh, yeah, have ideas. Of, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone, anyone 
Uh, if no one's asking, why, why not? Uh, great. Congratulations, Dan, and everybody. But Dan, Maxim, 20 years <laughs> holding uh, down the fort uh, for the experimental. And I also really admire the way you, as an editor, from the very, very close to the beginning, decided to kind of open up the curatorial roles of the press because most sing, you know single operator presses don't have this model you know uh, either or they have a contest model where they pick one famous person and then they charge a lot of money for <laughs> for submissions and everybody's a sucker except some lucky one person right but the way you did it 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 just right away opened it up to like monica was saying every year having this discontinuity but you were always there helping this vision along. And I, I'm, I'm really impressed by all of your work over the years. Um, and you've published a lot of very important books. Um, I, 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 they're all very well designed too. Uh, but I, I heard this idea that maybe you shouldn't, you know, like let's not think about marketing, but how do you see, I'm just curious in this very difficult economy and with more and more uh, strictures and structural problems that keep small press books out of bookstores, how do you see the, the press functioning? Is it, do you have to depend on state and national grants or uh, how, what's the future like in terms of, or, or, or private donations and from like poets giving you 10 bucks out of their pockets and, things like that or how how do you see this marketing problem uh, affecting the press in the future if you do so uh, if you do see it being an, an issue I'd be curious to know um well it's it's always year by year day by day um you know how you fund stuff but i think one of the things that's been really encouraging i think as a result of all the difficulty and things like everything in society kind of um going to crisis a little bit over the last couple of years there are there do seem like they're more um sort of grassroots solutions to some of the problems like for example wendy subway has invited us to participate in this current program where, where our books are sold in scotland and to european um buyer readers and um you know it's a very small pilot program but that's um that's like a community-led you know um solution to the fact that like you can't really you know we ship our books internationally but it's like takes like 10 weeks um you know it, it's it's expensive um you know people want books to review them and somewhere they want to have that book you have to send them a pdf um so that's just one example but i think also a lot of people are buying books directly from presses now and i think it's really encouraging especially during the pandemic people were reading like crazy so um i and they want authentic projects like so i think that um I'm encouraged because it feels like you've been around doing good work for a while. People find you, um, like all, like, you know, I think maybe other people with artistic projects have found this and then they want more of what you do. So, uh, that's, those are encouraging signs. Still got a lot of those sort of fundamental challenges that we've had all through the small presses have, but I think those are some things that make me a little bit more optimistic. Um, anybody else want to have any thoughts on the treasurer? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, what would I say? Um, I think we do have to do a lot of fundraising, though, uh, in the background. So, you know, whether we do benefit events or um, gatherings or, um, you know, solicit people's generosity, it's important. And, and that's, I think, something the board takes really seriously and um, try very hard to support the press as best we can. It's also really fun to get creative with the fundraising projects, like the one the one we were seeing, oh yeah, that Robert Wyatt, the musician, contributed a postcard for this project, messages to the future. Yeah. And those, those postcards were, um, became original artworks that were then sold to collections. One is at 
Yale. Uh, one's at Yale and one's, I think, at, um, in Delaware. Uh, Delaware, museum. Yeah. right. And eventually, um, it still could become a book, right? Yes. We're waiting for <laughs> the future to be really the future so that when we read this, we go, whoa, it really did come from a different era. We're still kind of in the same era in a way, right? But, um, um, yeah. But just, like, keep an eye out for things to come. Like, um, can we can we bring up the failed fundraising project because of the pandemic? I mean, it was just really fun to think about it. So we were thinking right, be right before we all were confined to our domestic dwellings, we were thinking of auctioning or, or having a raffle for people to have an experience, a, a live experience with someone who had donated their time. So we invite, we thought of like a hundred people, um, poets, people in our community, writers, playwrights, musicians, et cetera, uh, artists, to think of something that they would be willing to do with a stranger who paid money to do that in company, you know, in their company. So some, some people thought, yeah, okay, so a movie and, a, and dinner, right? Or like someone, watch me make dinner at my house. Or what were the other ideas? They were really, really good. And then it took a while to get it off the ground. And I have to say, I kind of was dragging my feet, maybe. We all were, a lot was happening. And then boom, once we actually had the list of contributors and the experiences they were willing to donate to Future Poem, the pandemic came. So I don't know, just keep an eye out for that. It might, we might resuscitate it, yeah. But um, it's, it's, and it's another way to keep the community. It's not only fundraising, right? It's a way of activating um, the community and getting it involved um, in, way, in other ways. There's more ways to be involved, not just reading or showing up at the readings. Mm -hmm. There we do, like a lot of other small presses, we're trying to do a subscription model too, which is, um, you know, you just in, you kind of, it's like a Kickstarter type of thing where you buy into the next four publications and you get, um, you get everything that the press does. So, I mean, we're a very small scale, um, place, but other places do, you know, give you 20 things a year. We give you four things a year and some special things, but it really makes a difference when we have this community of kind of direct supporters. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, even though it's these small scale things and then the fun rate, the real sort of larger fundraising efforts really are important. Um, but the, but the kind of support that we know we get from individual people giving $75 to get the publications a year, um, that just like spiritually, it feels really important to us. So um, that's just another way. Uh, we, I think we have to kind of do a bunch of different things to to, to survive. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I was wondering, can we maybe also see the rest of the postcards that were? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, <laughs> and um, a really great talk. Thanks for all your time. Can you read it? Can you read what it says? Prophetic. That one does seem prophetic, totally. Mm. Mm. A lot of them are very ominous and very heartfelt. There were some really heartfelt ones as well. Mm -hmm. And we had a, I had to cover up the addresses because there's actual people's addresses on all of these. And it was really kind of great to get them in the mail. This, that one was wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. 
That's really good. Yeah, like a Greek book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it in my. Um, thank you so much for coming, and um, we have um, this this beautiful print catalog that there's a surprise in the middle that Tom and Jessica um, designed um, like in no time at all for the fair. So I hope you will take one um, and thank, thanks so much for, for being here.